saying? What were you saying, Shirin? Sorry, Chairperson. There was apologies from the Minister and also apology from the Mayor of the City of Cape Town. Can we get who's the leader of the delegation and who's in our midst? Uh, so, uh, good evening, uh, Madam Chair. Uh, this is Ian Nielsen, Deputy Mayor, City of Cape Town. I also have with me uh, two of my mayoral committee colleagues, uh, Alderman Xanthia Limburg and uh, Councillor Zahid Bradrudin. Okay, Deputy Mayor, you will come. And the admin side, are you on your own? Sorry, uh, we have. Sorry, sorry Chair, let me just uh, correct what. We had been people too. We, we were in another, we were connected in another meeting and uh, we realized that uh, uh, we are in the wrong meeting. We, we used the link for the 15 hour, for the 3 o'clock meeting. So it's only now that when I when I click on the new link that, uh, so let me tell the colleagues to, to come and rejoin here. Who are uh, you? I'm Bule Loskava from Kokta, but I was with the, 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 the city manager for city of Cape Town, and also there were two committee members that were there. Okay, so can you inform them that there's a new link? Okay, uh, uh, Mayor, uh, so the city manager will be joining us this side as well. I suppose Councillor can Nelson. I, can I ask the Honourable Deputy Mayor to to call the City Manager because I don't have his contact details. Okay, I I will inform him. Uh, okay. uh, there was a bit of confusion because we we did receive two different links to this uh, for this meeting. There uh, was an I, earlier meeting. Uh, 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 our apologies, Deputy Mayor. An earlier meeting, which we thought we were going to continue from, then got cancelled. So then we had to, a, it was a joint meeting with the Human Settlement Portfolio Committee. So it got cancelled, and then Andy Le had to send a new link. And then we had thought it has been sent to everybody. Our apologies to that effect. That's fine, Madam Chair. I will inform the city manager, but I think we can... Continue in the meantime. Bulelo, uh, who were the other members that were with you the other side so that we can check them? Maybe the the the, the counting colleagues. Bulelo, where are we going to? Chairperson? Uh, you were also on the other link. Chairperson, you also have Kevin Naidu from Kokta in the meeting. Yes, I can see you, uh, Mr. Naidu. Where's Mbulelo? Mbulelo? I'm here, Chair. I've told them. Who, I managed to who are the other two members that were with you? Uh, I can't remember the, the, the name now. Um, but the, one of them was the former uh, uh, Premier of uh, Northern Cape and Minister of uh, for Transport. I think I saw the face. She can't be a committee member. You were in a wrong meeting, indeed, if that is the case. Yeah, I agree with you then, <laughs> Chair. Yeah, not even the one with an earlier link, I suppose. Okay. You mean, man, Peter? Yes, Chair. Yeah, <coughs> man, man. Yes. Uh, so, Madam Chair, from the city, we also have the Chief Financial Officer has joined, uh, Mr. Kevin Jacoby, uh, and also Mr. Caroline Knott from the Mayor's Office. So, what the city CFO's name, please? 
Kevin Jacoby. Kevin. Yes. I'm trying to check the name on the list here. Next to Kevin Naidu. Oh, they are together down there. The chair, I was with Kevin on the other meeting. Ah, uh, that so one I, is yeah. known for attending other meetings. Don't worry. Oh, we got him. Uh, Kevin Jacoby. Then, uh, okay, so we are fine. Are you concerned what that means for the party? This is a real moment. Whoever's, who, who's Blue Adil? Hello, Jack. Who's Blue Adil? Uh, good evening, Chair. I'm Ado Blow from the Auditor General's Office. Uh, then there's noise behind <coughs> you. Can you make sure whoever is behind yeah. you, that noise must go, ne? Yeah, there's no noise okay. behind me, Chair. Hello, Chair. Is it, is it sorted? Good evening, Chair. Yes, who's greeting the Chair? Uh, it's Mapa Gattau, uh, Chair. Good evening to you and good Honorable good Members. <laughs> you ain't in that meeting as well. <laughs> no, I've long been uh, uh, locked in chair. I just wanted to also indicate that uh, during the day I requested that uh, I invite some few chief directors from the National Disaster Management Center who are working uh, closely on this matter so that they can also have the opportunity to understand the issues. Or to avoid so that. Who are the chief directors, if I may ask? <clears throat> yes, we have uh, Miss Moldi Radikonyana. She has already logged in. Yeah. We also okay. have, yes, Miss Ribone Tau. She has also logged really in. in as well. uh, and the other yes. one. Is Ms. Riboni Tao related to you, the Deputy Minister? <laughs> uh, no, she she's not. Uh, we're related by surname. <laughs> oh, I see. Okay. Yes. Yeah, I think the other ones are committed. One of the chief directors was with the, with the, with the minister today. That's it why she's... I think we have a sensible number of yourselves here today. Thank you. Thank it is you. highly commendable for the years. We commend that. Okay, mm -hmm. colleagues. Sorry, so uh, uh, Madam Chair, the city manager, Cape Town, Salungelo Mbandazai, has now also joined the meeting. Joined the meeting. We're waiting for him. Thank uh, you. Yeah, he has joined. He has joined now. We can then start with the meeting. We didn't want to exclude him. Uh, Deputy Mayor, uh, uh, we sincerely appreciate you now coming also now to come and then the last time we couldn't have the mayor at least now that you are here yourself it's also something is much appreciated and thanks for responding to the call but there is somebody's line who's busy talking here can we first deal with the also noted sure can somebody recognize this voice it's Karago. Can I do that tomorrow morning? Or Who's that? Who's that? Oh, it. <laughs> I I know the voice from the city of Cape Town. It's the city Who's of Cape. Oh, Vimindava. Can we plead with you to close the meeting? So, it's the voice that is disrupting the meeting, uh, Honourable Mbumsa. Can we plead again with all of you? We know some of you might be busy doing something. Make sure that you put your your minds on mute so that you don't disrupt the meeting. This is a humble plea from the chair. And just to remind the colleagues to say this is a formal meeting. There's no answering of cell phones here. Yeah? Uh, if you want to be busy with something, make sure you mute your mic and also take off your video so that it doesn't disrupt the meeting, especially when you are not given the platform to speak. Can you make sure that your mics are always on mute? Because it's so disruptive. It also affects the 
other speakers that are on the platform as we are, we are busy uh, talking. Others talk to other people. Others, we know majority of you, you are working from home. You will hear those cups, those forks, those teaspoons. They are so disruptive. Whatever you want to do, make sure that before you do those things, your mic is on you, also your video is off, so that it doesn't also distract the other members that are participating in the meeting. Uh, I think we should welcome you, uh, Deputy Mayor and team. This is not our first interaction. At least a uh, uh, Councillor Suba also here. And then uh, we're just taking, moving forward. There were issues that we raised that we should believe in our letter. We were asked to, 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 to address, and I've seen it in your presentation, you have managed to address most of the issues that were the concerns by the members when we last met. We want to appreciate you coming, honoring this invitation, and we are here today. Without wasting much more time, uh, uh, I would like to hand over to you, Deputy Mayor. I'll give you 15 minutes to say whatever you want to say for the attention of the committee. Then members will then interact with your presentation. Over to you, Deputy Mayor. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. So we uh, did prepare two presentations, which we forwarded. Uh, can I, can, can I, I just get clarity? You want to... To, for me to take you through those presentations? Just highlight the things that you feel they are very key and critical for the committee to know in those 15 minutes. All right. Can, yeah. And, can, and I then just, the other uh, thing, can I plead with all of you who will be on the platform, if you can try to put your videos on, the time when you are speaking, you are given a platform to speak, put your video on, like Deputy Mayor now. You see, uh, there you go. Who's Ovi? The one that was making noise, she's on my screen also. Ovi, can you put your video on because you are on my screen? Over to you. Okay. Uh, Thank you. So if I could just get clarity, uh, Madam Chair, whether uh, I, it's the first time I've been on uh, the uh, system with you. Uh, yes. Are you going to load the presentation or must I do it from my screen? Whichever way, what do you want to do? Uh, we always allow the presenter to load so that when, wherever you want to skip, then it's easier to, to you than the, the, the parliamentary staff does. There okay. You go. So, so, can you see my presentation now? Yes. Chairperson? Yes. Chairperson, I apologize. It's Councillor Zaid Badruddin speaking. Um, I, I apologize to interrupt the Deputy Mayor, but I did want to bring it to the committee's attention uh, with your permission, please. The last time when I presented to the committee, it was um, noted that we would be allowed additional time at this meeting so that we could share in more detail um, the efforts of the City of Cape Town in terms of our COVID preparedness, uh, especially as it relates here in this case to our water projects and the financial implications. So I kindly request, Chair, that you consider perhaps allowing the Deputy Mayor more time uh, to present yes. the information so that, like the other cities previously, at the previous sitting, we would be given the same amount of time. Please, thank you. <laughs> My apologies. Thanks for reminding us. So I'll give the, 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 the Deputy Mayor at least uh, 20, if it's late, 25 minutes. That's much okay. better. Okay. I've never uh, given any mayor such time. Thank you, Madam Chair. So okay. uh, if I can proceed, uh, and I'll take you through this as quickly as possible, um, but we can always come back if there are any particular questions. So uh, we were asked to... Uh, address the issue of, of the, the budget impacts uh, of COVID-19 and the financial impacts. Uh, so this is just looking at the billing for the last three months. So you can see uh, we've been, uh, the billing, from the billing side, it's been fairly normal in terms of, of amounts of around two and a half billion rand a month. Uh, that has not been uh, substantially different. Uh, obviously, the difference has been in the collections. Uh, but these uh, billings in April and May 
were under circumstances where our meter readers could not go out. So the the billings were based on uh, on estimates. Uh, but now that the meter readers are are back in working, uh, we hope now during this month that uh, we can ensure that that the June uh, billings will ensure that they are accurately and based on 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 actual amounts. Uh, but you can see that from a billions perspective, there was not a great of a problem in terms uh, of income. Uh, however, uh, what has happened during April and May has been a fall off in in our collections. So you'll see uh, the collection rates that we had during March, which was essentially before uh, the the lockdown period. Uh, so, uh, as you can see, those were, were still very good. We were achieving the kind of high uh, collection rates that, that we aspire to. But you can see that during April and May, there was a fall off. Uh, so, April average around 77% and May around 79%. So, roughly uh, 15 to 20% fall off uh, in collection. Uh, and that, of course, is a substantial amount of money for, for the city of several hundred millions rand. Uh, so uh, we have then in the adjustment budget that we, uh, we passed during May, uh, have reduced our uh, assumed uh, collection rates for this current financial year, uh, as shown in this table. So, for example, uh, although we had previously budgeted for a 96% uh, collection rate, we have uh, dropped that to 93% for, for the financial year. Uh, the big issue has been this, the amount of debt impairment. Uh, so again, this is for the current financial year, and it's essentially for these last three months of the financial year. We've increased our debt impairment by 244 million rand uh, to, to uh, allow for, for these under collections uh, in these last three months of the financial year. Uh, for the new budget, for the new financial year, starting 1st of July, uh, in our draft budget, we had uh, we had tabled uh, certain collection rates, uh, and we've had to now revise that given uh, the the circumstances uh, that, that have now arisen. Uh, obviously, this this is uh, this is is. Uh, these numbers are now estimates. We, we're in new uh, territory here, so it may be that during the course of the year we may have to amend these again, but at this moment in time, this is what we have provided for, uh, for a, a lower collection rates than what we uh, had previously anticipated. So you can see for property rates, for example, uh, we have dropped that to an assumed 90% uh, collection rate for the new financial year. Uh, this, of course, has significant impact on on uh, on our debt. Uh, and again, uh, for the new financial year, the uh, we have had to then increase our debt impairment by 1.4 billion rand uh, to to account for those those lower collection ratios. So uh, obviously we can't uh, just allow this to to continue without without action. Uh, we uh, we obviously understand the the circumstances of the public and that the fact that we uh, we have to in these circumstances uh, uh, make allowance for for the change circumstances and the fact that people are losing their jobs. Uh, and uh, do not necessarily have the income they had previously. Uh, so uh, we're monitoring this very closely. Uh, we have uh, provided for, uh, for, for uh, steps that people can take, for example, to, uh, to apply to us for, uh, for payment arrangements and so on. Uh, we've also looked to where we can assist people with the uh, rebates, where people can more quickly apply and qualify as an indigent person if they have lost their job. Uh, so we have looked at all of these matters to assist people, um, and we're constantly monitoring the situation. We're, for example, looking at liquidations and deregistration of companies 
Uh, but this is not at this stage giving us any clear indication uh, of what is happening. I think it's simply too soon uh, in the process to understand these things. But uh, we we continue to to see where we can help companies uh, in this period. Uh, water revenue uh, is, uh, as I said earlier, uh, we build according uh, uh, according to estimates, because the uh, beta readers were not able to go out. Um, and so we believe that that represents an over recovery. Uh, and we expect a downward adjustment as the beta readings now start coming through. But we, pro we need about another month's worth of, uh, of billings before we, we have a really clear picture of, of what this impact has been. Uh, on electricity revenue, uh, we uh, we have seen some some under recovery of cash, but because in Cape Town a very large portion uh, of our electricity service is now on prepayment meters, uh, the impact is not as big as as, as it has on water. Uh, and on refuse collection, we have uh, again seen a, a lower collection rate. Um, but we will continue to, to manage that. Um, and to accommodate that fall in cash, uh, we have taken out the, the provisions that we had allocated for, for uh, cash to go to, to the capital replacement reserve uh, so that uh, we, can, we can ensure that we uh, get through this financial year without, uh, w without a, a cash uh, problem. So uh, the impact now, the, the broader impact on, on the next financial year has been, is quite substantive in terms of our estimates. And this table, I think if you look at the column on the right hand side, just to look at the totals, uh, there are essentially three big impacts. One is the additional requirements of additional expenditure we're having to incur. Uh, that is a whole range of issues uh, from additional PPE for, for our frontline staff uh, to ad additional services, uh, particularly uh, water and sanitation in informal settlements, uh, and, and a whole range of other issues assisting the provincial government in response to the, uh, uh, on the health aspects uh, at our clinics and so on. So that's the 903 million rand additional expenditure. Uh, as I also already mentioned, the increased debt impairment because of the anticipated lower collection rates. But the th a third act action is, is reduction in revenue as well. Specifically, the biggest number around that is reduction in electricity sales. Uh, that we've already seen and we now anticipate to continue into the new financial year. Uh, and we're estimating that around 1.4 billion rand lower sales uh, in or lower re revenue. Um, so the total impact uh, uh, for COVID-19 on our, on our new financial year budget uh, of 3.8 billion rand. But on the other hand, there has been some uh, projected under expenditure uh, as an example, because we are selling less electricity, we will also be buying less electricity from ESCOM. Um, and, uh, and there are other, other aspects within our expenditure uh, that, uh, that follow of about 1.7 billion rand. So the net impact anticipated on the, on the budget uh, was 2.1 billion rand, which we have factored now into our uh, into our budget uh, the finalized the budget that was adopted by council at the end of uh, end of May uh, so I won't speak too much on this this was simply that that as I've already mentioned we seek to accommodate the customer essentially in line with national Treasury's recommendations um, but uh, uh, adapt ourselves accordingly. So we have uh, made a whole range of revenue arrangements to assist people and have informed them 
uh, of assistance that they can get. Uh, we have, for example, increased the uh, the on the rates rebate for indigent people. Uh, was previously up to a household income of six thousand rand a month. We've increased that to seven thousand rand a month. Uh, and there are other measures that we have have applied. So my last slide on on uh, the financial aspects. Uh, you in your uh, your letter did request that we speak to the issue uh, of uh, assistance from provincial and national government. So I mean I think the first thing is that uh, we have heard that the the, the president. Uh, spoke of a 20 billion allocation to local government. Uh, we are still waiting to hear, and I think all of local government is still waiting to hear uh, exactly how that 20 billion rand is to be allocated and when and how uh, uh, it is to be accessed. So our, our appeal is that that is finalized as soon as possible, because I think the impacts uh, that, that we are facing, that the sooner we can uh, uh, get access to to whatever funding is there, uh, the better for us. But I think it's also important to speak to uh, that that spheres of government need to take responsibility for their constitutional mandates. Uh, and, and this may seem obvious, but uh, it is our experience, and I, I don't think we are the only local government that experiences this, is that very often... Um, uh, state departments uh, do not f full, fulfill all their, their, their responsibilities and it ends up that it's left at, at the door of local government to fulfill. Uh, so uh, particularly now in these circumstances uh, with the ex significant growth in, uh, in health requirements, uh, we are really calling on, on uh, national and provincial government to, to fulfill their requirements on health. We are there willing to, to, to assist, uh, but, but really financially uh, we, it's been difficult for us to take on additional costs. Um, and as all of the issues, including those, for example, for isolation um, and so on, uh, that these things uh, need to be taken up by the relevant departments and not uh, left uh, for us to deal with. Um, so uh, the uh, we've had, there's not been a big impact on, on conditional grants and there has been some, uh, some allowance given to us to reallocate uh, some of those conditional grants. Uh, and uh, so uh, that... Uh, that is something that, that we, we hope will continue, um, and, but it's important that, that we get access to those grants uh, because that assists us uh, to be able particularly to get economic activity going. I think significantly as we get the economy running again, the one way we can contribute to getting the economy running is to get uh, capital projects going, to get activity going in the construction sector, uh, this will significantly assist towards re uh, rejuvenating the economy. So uh, it's important that we uh, that those grants, conditional grants, also continue to flow to us. Uh, uh, we we speak to supply chain management abuse by contractors. Um, we have not particularly had a great problem with it, but we have seen, for example. Um, uh, in terms of getting PPE for for staff, the, that there are there are those out there who want to want to charge excessive amounts. Uh, we are we are not willing to pay those those kind of amounts, uh, but we we hope that that uh, national treasury uh, will will deal with uh, those who try to take take advantage of these circumstances uh, uh, and take uh, uh, deal with those that that uh, have corrupt practices. And we just then also appeal for flexibility to allow us to perform. Um, very often, the response from national government has been more regulations. We, we believe that we have so many regulations now, it makes it quite often very difficult for us to perform. 
Um, and so we are just appealing for uh, for more uh, flexibility in, in such regulations. And that if any new regulations come forward at this time, is that we local government is given adequate time to uh, to respond to any draft proposals. Um, we, we have had cases now where we're given 24 hours to comment. There's really not enough. Uh, we really need to begin at adequate time. Uh, so, Madam Chair, uh, that, that brings me to the end of my presentation. Uh, but my colleague, um, Alderman Limburg, uh, would like to speak to your other question, which is around water provision uh, uh, during this period. If I could hand over to her, please. Santhia? Good evening, everyone. I hope that I'm audible uh, to the committee. Thank you very much for this opportunity to be able to address the Portfolio Committee on the City's COVID-19 Response Plan. Um, Joining us as part of our delegation, um, in addition to the um, representatives which the Deputy Mayor made mention of earlier, is our Executive Director for the Water and Waste Directorate uh, within the City of Cape Town, Mr. Mike Webster, as well as our Manager um, for Informal Settlements Basic Services within the Water and Sanitation Department, Mr. Lars Ndundo. Uh, Mr. Lars um, Dondo is going to take us through the presentation, uh, which covers uh, a status update of our water tank um, and water tank uh, uh, program. I must just um, highlight uh, before I hand over to uh, Lars, um, the city's COVID-19 response plan is made up of three priority areas. One. Um, involves maintaining existing um, services and enhancing existing services within uh, recognized and registered informal settlements within the city of Cape Town. This is inclusive of maintaining just over 50,000 toilets and over 7,000 uh, standpipes or taps. Uh, we have also during this time enhanced janitorial services that assist with maintaining this infrastructure and this forms part of priority one. Priority two uh, deals with uh, emergency provision and temporary services to underserved areas um, and this is what we will be speaking about this evening uh, pertaining to the water tank and water tanker uh, rollout program. And then the third priority as part of the City of Cape Town's COVID-19 response plan uh, includes um, additional health and hygiene measures within informal settlements to ensure that we mitigate uh, the spread of the virus uh, to our most vulnerable uh, residents, particularly those residing in informal settlements uh, where conditions are often dense um, and the informality does lead to many other health risks. Um, and so that essentially is what the city has been focused on uh, during the lockdown period, and a significant uh, amount of resources has been uh, geared towards that. Um, I will now hand over to my colleague, uh, Larson Window, who will take us through the progress to date in relation to um, water tank installations and the delivery of water via the water tankers. Thank you. Thank you so much, Councillor uh, Limbert. Can I hand over to Mr. Las Mudondo to present a set? And thank you so much, Madam Chair, and thank you so much, uh, Alderman Limbert. And I'll quickly go through the presentation. It's about 12 slides, um, and I'll try to be as brief as possible. Um, so, as already indicated by Elderman Limberg, um, 
I'm trying, as already indicated by Alderman Limberg, um, we came up with a strategy um, um, or rather a response. And in this response, um, it had um, three priority areas. I'll be focusing on priority area number two. And so when I'll, I'll just go, go through, go through the, the, the background and then I'll go through the priority lists and also the challenges in the different phases of the, of, of this priority area. So when, 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 when COVID-19 hit us, we quickly had to come up with a, with a response. And the response basically had to um, respond to, you know, how do people in informal settlements, um, how can we assist them um, to improve hygiene practices? And how can we also um, provide um, water points? And so we came up with a suggestion that um, we, we identify priority areas, or in other words, we identify informal settlements that had not been served. And there was a list of 107 informal settlements. Of those 107 informal settlements, some of them we had, or um, some of them are on um, uh, city-owned land, and some of them are on uh, privately owned land. And so we also had to um, think of um, how can we quickly um, provide these tanks, especially to to informal settlements that are on, on city-owned land because it's quite a process to get um, consent from private owners. And so we, we, we prioritized or we then identified 16 areas that were on um, city-owned land and uh, we then engaged um, our service providers together with, um, together with um, uh, various other stakeholders. Uh, so initially, we planned to roll out 250 water tanks um, but due to budget constraints, and as already indicated by the deputy mayor, we had to revise those installations and so sorry those plans, and so we we cut that um, down to 93 tank installations, and this was going to be part of our phase one in this priority area. Um, and then we are approached by the Department of National uh, by the National Department of Water and Sanitation. And um, they offered, um, I think it was in excess of 244 tanks initially, and uh, later on they revised this um, this figure to 214 tanks, um, and that we 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 planned to do as part of our phase two in this priority area, and then for us, in order for us to reduce operational costs, because this comes at a very high cost, we then um, came up with an idea to. Um, try to reticulate these because under normal circumstances um, we have to use water trucks to fill these um, water tanks. Um, this is just an example um, of how these water tanks look like. You, as you can see, we've got a base stand and also we've got taps um, and also we've got um, washing basins um, specifically for washing hands but we also have um, taps that are specifically designed to um, fetch water, to carry water using buckets. So this is the initial list that I talked about. As you can see, the list has different structure counts. So for instance, um, the highest structure count is in Mon Monobisi Park. It is also worth noting that in Monobisi Park, this is where um, the land was recently invaded. I think about um, just over 18 months ago, this land was invaded. There was an existing informal settlement, but it, the, the, other set, the other portion of land was invaded with more than 7,500 structures, which makes a population of three times that amount, which is basically about 20, 24,000 people living, living in that area alone. And so based on this, we then said, we then said, let us let us engage um, communities, and I'll take I'll take I'll take you through um, um, how that went uh, with the communities and the community leaders and the councillors, um, in order for us to find space and to agree with community uh, communities for us to, to place these tanks. Um, unfortunately, um, due to reasons that I'll dwell on in, the, in my next slide, 
we had to cut down this list of 16 priority areas to 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 four priority areas, um, which was Monabisi Park, Nsinweni, Congo, in Fuleni, and Wales, and Ganza, which is in Mali, Palestine. And like I said, um, uh, we had to also to revise um, the number of tank allocation. So in Monabisi Park, we said we will install 214 tanks. All of these were provided by the National Department of Water and Sanitation, and the rest, Nsinweni, Congo, and Uganda, uh, were provided by were provided by tanks that we used, um, um, that that we procured um, within 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 the city. So so here are some of the issues that we encountered when we did our initial site investigations. Um, so when we consulted with ward councillors, community leaders. And um, when we uh, when we were working with our service providers, uh, unfortunately, um, we could not agree, or we could not get consent um, from 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 communities to make space, because some of these, because all of these informal agreements are very dense, um, and so we had to we had to revise it to the areas that I that that that, that I mentioned, and also, of course. Um, um, we also had to make it a point, or we also had to plan to reticulate these tanks so that we can reduce our our, our operational costs. So in phase one, I'm pleased to say that we, we completed phase one, and we completed phase, phase one on the 30th of April, and we currently are using, um, on average, 28 trucks uh, per day to not only not only service these or refuel these tanks. But also to um, give water to people that do not have that do not have access to basic services, um, and uh, the list has since grown from 107 informal settlements to 173 informal settlements. Um, um, so we started implementation of phase two, uh, which was the, which, which were the tanks that were received from uh, the National Department of Water Conservation. And um, as I said, the initial the initial tanks was 244, um, and we, we we later agreed that um, we will only install 214 tanks. Um, uh, this began on the 6th of May, and as of yesterday, we completed the last tanks that we had to install. Um, um, yeah, I think that's, that's this slide. And then, um, as I'm about to conclude. Um, despite the challenges that we experienced, um, uh, the com- community unrest, administrative delays, and and everything else, we are pleased to, to inform you that we have managed to install all the tents that we had plans to install. And to date, um, uh, there is there is 307 tents. Uh, sorry that I put in the 290. 307 tents, um, and we have so far. Um, distributed water via water trucks, uh, 41 million liter, 41 million liters of 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 water that we have used that we have uh, transported via via water trucks. Uh, space constraints remains a challenge, um, and we are we are installing uh, ten pipes where we are not able to to install um, uh, the, the, the the water tanks, and um, the setup cost. And um, some of the operational costs, we will be re- recovering from rainwater and there's an assignment argument and an Im- implementation protocol to that, to that effect. So just a bit of um, cost involved. For us to set up um, the, the, the tanks, um, we, 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 we had to, we had to, we had, we had, we had to have a budget of over, a mil- over 4 million rands. And um, and all of this we have we've already we've already installed like I've said, and for us to be able to reticulate, or let me rather say, for us to be able to re- to, to fill up these tanks will cost us um, um, in excess of 10 million rands per month, uh, and some of this money will be recovered from rainwater, but not all of them, not not all of the 10 million rands will be recovered from from rainwater. And, and we are still confirming the figures 
um, with, rain, with, with rainwater uh, based on the assignment agreements and the um, implementation protocol. And um, um, here is this, 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 uh, this slide talks to the, to the water tankers uh, or rather the water trucks that we have deployed in the, in the various regions or various depots, if you like. We are using service providers that are accompanied by our depot members to distribute this, wa this water. Um, um, unfortunately, due to um, positive cases uh, amongst, our, amongst our staff members, we have had to scale down of, uh, on, on some of these um, distributions um, um, due to some of our staff members um, testing positive. And like I said, uh, we have thus far been able to transport via water trucks 41 million liters of water. So we keep track of our of uh, of the water that we of the volume of water that we that we supply per week. So on average, we supply about um, just over just over 4,000 kiloliters of, of of water per week in all of our in all of our four regions or four depots, if you like. So here, lastly, here, is a operation, here are some of the operational issues that, we have, that we've been facing. Um, um, you will all agree with us that um, it's very expensive uh, to sustain delivering water to these communities using water trucks. Per, on average, per day, it costs us uh, 200,000 200, rands which amounts to more than 10 million rands per, per month. Um, the areas that we are servicing uh, using these uh, water trucks has increased to 173 areas, and sometimes these trucks are targeted by criminal, criminal elements, uh, which makes it very difficult for us to, to deliver water. Um, and also when there are protest actions, makes it, make, it makes it difficult for us to, to move water. And of course, uh, the narrow roads and the conditions um, of the roads uh, in informal settlements is not very conducive for us to, to sustain this. And um, thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Mdondo. So thank you, Madam Chair. That ends our, our presentations. Uh, Councillor Badruddin. Was that not sufficient time? Chairperson, <laughs> I must thank you for accommodating you. Uh, <laughs> it's how I've come to know you, Chair. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much. Um, can we remove the presentation on the screen at uh, City of Cape Town? Uh, Deputy Mayor, can you put your video on? Same with uh, Councillor Badrodin and uh, uh, Mr. Last Mudondo. Please put your video on so that uh, you are live. They want to see your faces. Okay. Uh, the only one who's missing is Councillor Badrodin. You can do that as well. Uh, colleagues? You must breathe first. Ne? Allow the other colleagues to breathe after raising the hand so that I note you correctly. Kaba, 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 Operman, welcome. I know you had challenges of connecting. So, who else? I'll go before Becky and David. Now, you come before Becky and David. Honorable Chair, I will tackle Honorable Hussein. Yeah, you'll be the last one. <laughs> yeah, you. Um, did I omit um, the tell you Are you fine? Okay. So we'll deal with this. Uh, uh, Mom Keys, eh? you are the first one. Yeah, yeah, yes, my chairperson. 
Chair, <clears throat> let me welcome the presentation from the city of Cape Town. And uh, <clears throat> it is very good and nice. But Chairperson, I have a problem about the city of Cape Town. Because uh, in Kukule, to informal settlement, and Kailisha informal settlement, uh, the city of Cape Town, they are not giving all people of the city of Cape Town services that they deserve. They, they just give those who are members who are born for the DA, which is not good what they are doing in, in Cape Town. People of Cape Town, they are crying every day. They don't have water, but we, we see so many tanky, nice programs here in the screen. But those nice programs, they are not all the people, those who are suffering in Cape Town. Uh, if I may ask you, Chairperson, what happened to the people who were evicted in Cape Town? Where they are now? Did they get this water? What happened about the sanitizer? Because the, 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 the pandemic is more escalating in Cape Town. What is the plan in place to the city of Cape Town about the people who were grabbing the land? Because those are the people of South Africa. They have a right to, to have a land. They have a right to stay under the shelter. That is why they were put, they were, they, they were building the, the, those uh, uh, chairs so that they can achieve the reparation and stay inside the house. But the city of Cape Town go and demolish everything. What happened to those people as we speak now? Why the city of Cape Town uh, is excluding people who are staying in the informal segment, especially those who are not members of the DA. Those who are the members of the DA, they are covered. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Honorable Chavan Chava. Honorable Chesa. Honorable Chesa. Thank you very much, uh, Chairperson of the committee. I, 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 I am going to start from 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 the last question upwards. Uh, maybe this would give us structure. You know, uh, there is a there is a slide, Chairperson, in the presentation where it, it talks about priority lists. So I want to ask the city of Cape Town as to what are the specific details of the patient sites of tanks. Because mention, just mentioning two, 214 tanks allocation for Monabi's informal settlement is not helpful uh, because we can't get a sense of which ones are outstanding and what will happen to the ones that are outstanding the settlements that are outstanding. We can't get a sense of that if you do, do not give us the details in terms of the words, the location, and why why, why that particular location. Secondly, Chair, uh, they, they, they speak about, uh, on, on, on the slide that, speak up, that, that, that talks about operational issues on water tankers, right? They say that the water trucks uh, are often targeted, or they say sometimes, you know, by criminals. Have they considered involving the community police forum to deal with the criminal element and the safety of the water trucks, thus access to the, need, to, to the needed water services in those areas? Uh, that is informal settlements. Uh, the other issue that I want to raise with, with the city of Cape Town is the issue of Vincent Beck. Uh, there are seven informal settlements there with no informal set, with no uh, uh, provision of water, no toilets during this critical period. What is the plan of the city to actually provide uh, uh, necessary water that is needed at this time? And where are they going to to, to, to where, where is the community going to access those water tanks? Uh, number the other the, the other question that I have, Chair, uh, 
is, 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 is as to when is the city going to develop those informal settlements? Because surely the, the, the city must, must be. Look, Chairperson, there is 437 informal settlements in the city of Cape Town. 292 are said to have been served. Meaning that when you might minus 292 from, from, from 437, you get 145 uh, uh, informal, outstanding informal settlements. What is going to happen to those outstanding informal settlements with regard to the provision of water at this time? Uh, I didn't get that sense. Uh, where are the plans? Where are the plans in place for the city? Because those, those, those out of those 40, 437 with uh, uh, informal settlements, with 146,000 households, some of them, some of them, Chair, were there during, even during apartheid. And, but, but the city has not, has not, has not uh, even recognized the permanent residence. And, the, you know, and, and, and there is lack of occupation there. Of, in terms of occupation rights. So, so what, what, what is it? When are they going to re, re, recognize that? Uh, and please, the city must not speak here, Chair, about immigration and all those uh, 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 make uh, 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 subservient uh, issues. Because they, they are also responsible for, 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 for taking people from, from, from Eastern Cape wherever it, whenever it is convenient to, during the... the, 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 the the, 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 the harvest season and pay them mega salaries and then dump them. So what will happen to those people? Section 26 of the, of the Constitution of this country, the Republic of South Africa, says everyone has a right to have access to adequate housing. This is why I'm asking this question. Because our people do not seem to have a right in that city. They, as we speak, Chair, the people of uh, that the, there's an area now now as as it is raining in Cape Town that is evicting people right now and and often that 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 comes across as 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 bias to me Jefferson to us that comes across as bias and that's dangerous because uh, whenever the 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 the, 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 the people occupy. Uh, 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 land in, uh, uh, next to, to, to opulent areas, the city starts, uh, uh, begins to actually uh, 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 comes to the protection of, the, of, of those who have in society. And so we, 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 need, we need clarity in terms of the development of our people. Because the overall coverage of, of, of the suburbs and obsession of the suburbs in Cape Town over over the people that are needed at times for, 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 profit, for profit in those farms, over the people that, 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 that come to those areas, to, 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 to Cape Town, to, as, as they have the, the constitutional right to come to any city anyway. So, so uh, the, the city of Cape Town, please, please assist us in terms of the details here in this report, because we don't seem to get a sense of, 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 of where the water tankers are and, and and, and which word and so can you just provide with that? Thank you very much, Chair, for the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you, Honorable Cesar. Honorable Mpomza. Honorable Mpomza. Yes, Chair, am I audible? Yes, put on yes, and very clear. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Chair. Uh, Chair, let's uh, welcome the presentation by the Deputy of the City, uh, Councillor Zanti Alenbeck, and uh, the officials. The Mayor has, uh, in his presentation, indicated the challenge of uh, the contraction of uh, uh, revenue collection. Uh, against uh, the projected billing. And also he indicates that uh, this, this could indicate or probably lead to loss of jobs and uh, then uh, particularly for... Your face. 
We're missing yes. your face. Oh, yes. thank you. Yes. That this could lead to increase the, uh, in the loss of jobs and job opportunities, particular for poor households. Now, wh what what plan has the city put in place to cushion uh, the adverse effect of the loss of jobs and uh, the increase uh, in the number of the indigent population? Has the city provided uh, or established some form of a food bank for distribution and provision uh, to the needy and the destitute? That would be my first question. Secondly, Chair, the Deputy Mayor is indicating that uh, some of these regulations, uh, they have elements that have a limiting effect on the performance of the city. Can uh, the Mayor please assist this committee by actually exposing to us these particular regulations that have a limiting effect on the performance of the city. Also, on the provision of uh, portable water, you are indicating that uh, in your city we have uh, 107 informal settlements. And uh, Councillor Zantia Lindbeck was indicating that we have made provision of 50,000 toilets. I didn't get uh, the number of uh, the stand pipes that you are installing in those uh, particular uh, 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 informal settlement areas. You are indicating also that we had established and planned for 16 priority areas through water provisioning. You are saying that this will have scaled down that 16 priorities into four areas. And you are indicating that uh, because of densely populated areas and other areas, you have a difficult to accept. Now, the critical question is, in your COVID response plans, what is it that you have put in place as an alternative to ensure that you provide portable water in those densely populated areas so that the issue of health and hygiene it is actually fully implemented for those things to arrest the spread of the virus. Now, I don't get a sense there uh, that having dropped your priorities and uh, now you are saying we are moving in phases. So your phase one is done is over a month. We will be getting in there because this is an emergency matter that requires urgent action to protect lives and also to save lives and to flatten the curve of the spread in those particular areas, which should have been a priority. I am concerned by the fact that we have reduced your priority. And uh, I am looking at the speed that will be moving and intervening in those particular areas. At the same time, uh, you are indicating that uh, you have also provided within this period 41 million liters of water. Is this over the two months or over a month uh, of potable water? And why then are you not in a position uh, to budget an increase for, because I want, I'm interested, your trucks is cutting water. How often are you cutting water into these communities? And are you getting in in these communities where that are inaccessible? What alternative are you coming with? to ensure that you reach those particular communities. My last short share, whilst I appreciate the good work of the city, I'm very disappointed that in this time, despite that the regulations are indicating that evictions are suspended, but currently as we speak today, the councillors of the DA in your city, Mayor, have abused the power by putting on enforcement uniform evicting people in Hot Bay. Why are you doing that? Why are you evicting people when regulations are saying no evictions? And why are DA councillors abusing the power 
evicting people in law enforcement officers being councillors. Why are you doing this? Can I share? Thank you, Honorable Mpumza, for the intervention. Honorable Mkalipi. Thank you very much, Chairperson. Um, thank you very much, uh, Deputy Mayor, uh, for the presentation and all other people who have made a uh, presentation. But I just want to concur with my uh, previous speakers, my colleagues here, to say that we are very much disappointed as we are receiving your presentation today because as we speak here, there are people, especially poor black people, who are busy every today in what? In Hot Bay. Uh, you, you will know very well which word is that. Um, and please, if you can clarify us as why in what 74, eviction in what 74 today in Hot Bay? Uh, we are not saying that it is okay at any day, at any time, but we should thought that as leadership of the city, you can even use your powers to stop that evictions, especially in this cold weather. And we would like Chair, I would strongly recommend that they must address us on that evictions that is happening today. Because even the videos that we are receiving as this committee members is a very dis disturbing video. And as Ubabu Mpumza is asking exactly specifically, and I think also Ubabu Uteza also asked specifically but why during COVID-19. It's not the first time, Chairperson. I think even last time when we met as the committee, there was also an issue in one of the ward that even Minister Sisulu had to flew back to Cape Town. And there was a court case in, uh, according to this eviction that is taking place in Cape Town. And they couldn't also answer give us an answer as the city to why evictions is still taking place after the regulations are very clear. And today Cape Town is very cold. I mean, I don't know if the city, they don't care about the life of the black people because I'm sure those people who are evicted today in Hot Bay are the black people. There are women, there are children there in this cold weather. And this is not the first time. Last time, one of the members of this committee also wanted to know what happened to those people of Strainfontein. And we didn't get answers. And a few weeks ago, years ago, we saw those people on the news. They were taken by the city and put under the bridge. The city misled them, say, we are going to relocate you all the way to, to the bridge. When they arrived under the bridge, they were told that, no, we are coming back, we are going to make some plans. Even today, we are not even told about what happens to those people. So the city of Cape Town, through the mayor, must account about those people today. And even those, those ones who are talking right now, who does not have any place to sleep, is very painful of what is happening in Cape Town, especially this COVID-19. And I concur with my colleagues to say, I mean, there's nothing that it, it, it can make us to be happy as members of the committee, whereby you are coming and... Uh, 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 give us a very beautiful presentation in the paper. And we can see that this presentation is just a PR exercise. When it comes to the presentation that was presented here, lastly, I can't remember the name of a black brother who was doing the presentation. It's just a PR, merely PR exercise. And you are telling us that uh, you can't even uh, uh, insert some of the water tanks because the community didn't allow you. Who is leadership? We are not a leadership in the city of Cape Town. Because you know that it's life of a black person does not matter. That's why when those people are up in arms, you can't even guide them. You can't even tell them that, no, this one is very important because it talks to your life of, because of this COVID-19. So it's not acceptable. And you are talking about those few informal settlements. There are people in Cape Town who are living in backyards, and there is no clear plan in terms of how are you going to make sure those people who are living in backyards are also taken care in terms of uh, these water tanks. And I was also listening to this presentation to say uh, phase one, you have uh, passed phase one. What phase one? Because even the number of tanks that you are telling us is not even convincing. I can't even remember hearing you telling us about how are you going to ensure that people they have clean toilets 
because when you talk about informal settlement, there is an issue of uh, sanitation as well. So you just concentrated on water. The second issue that I want also to ask Chairperson is the issue of uh, quarantine sites. You know Cape Town is an epicenter of COVID-19 and you are not even updated in terms of quarantine sites. Where are those sites? What is the real plan of City of Cape Town to make sure that as an epicenter people who have been contravening COVID-19 are taken to the quarantine? Where are those sites? Where? Because at some point we need to go and see those sites if you want to be very clear about the end of the team. Chairperson, going to the slides that they presented today, uh, slide three that talks about the current collection. If you can also uh, share with us as community members, is how do you manage now? Because you are telling us that uh, in, uh, in May you managed to collect under electricity, I think is 97% from 83% in April. So please share with us because most of the people have lost their jobs and the logic is to say that since March people have lost jobs and people they don't want to pay because they can't afford paying. But it seems as if most of the time here the property rates, electricity revenue, water, sanitation revenue, refuse revenue, it seems as if in, in, May, in May you have many to, to collect more. The problem started in March and in April at least you collected something but now you have managed to collect. So please can you share with us how did you manage to collect more in terms of the percentages? If, you, if, you, if I can uh, check on the, on the slides that were share with us. Because also in slide 8 you said COVID-19 has had a negative impact on the cash collected rates built during the hard lockdown periods for the city of Cape Town. It does not talk to the slide three to say that, no, you have collected more in May compared to April. Because when you narrate your story here in slide eight, you are saying that there's a negative impact. If you can also share with us here. And then the, 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 the third one, Chairperson, is on slide 12, when you talk about assisting the consumers, customers. Please share with us in order to understand how are you assisting customers or consumers. We are talking about the debt collection policy which the city have, and also in the same time you are telling us that there is uh, it through your credit control or debt collection uh, you have made loans to members of public, but you are not even telling us in, in details how are you. Uh, assisting people when you're making loans. What loans? Who qualify for those loans? On what period? What is your intention? Are you not uh, putting people into more debts if you are creating loans for the people? And uh, if I go to uh, to the very same uh, slide, which is slide 12, the reduction rates. You said uh, options such as no interest. So if you just I think I need you, I need more clarity on this one. It's very good, no reduction, no interest of certain categories, or even made mention of people who are getting pension, who are, does not get pensions. But if you are saying no interest, and then what about those who lost their jobs? Because here, most of the municipalities who have come before this committee, we have been asking for them specifically what intervention they have for the people in the city, because. The core is that people are, are losing their job during COVID. And when you lost your job, you uh, I'm going to pay, but with no interest, it's still a burden. The debt, it does not go away. Please just share with us uh, as a committee members in order for us to know, Guti, how are you intervening? Uh, there is a long-standing issue of Marikana. I think the deputy mayor, deputy mayor will also know that in Marikana, even the minister who is the minister of transport now, he was the minister of policy, even went to Marikana because Marikana, it seems as if there is a crisis, crisis in terms of crime. So how are you intervening in that such area? Because uh, we can't just let, let it just uh, open like that. Please allow us to, 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 to know what, what is your plan in terms of Marcan. And electricity, illegal connection of electricity. 
uh, in Ward 14, Mpule, 114, Mpule, is a safety issue on its own. How do you address that issue? Because it's a long standing issue in Ward, Ward 114. Uh, people are complaining that there is an increase of water and electricity and basic service tariff. And uh, now we are coming with this uh, 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 presentation which does not talk to those things that is, uh, happened before the COVID-19. Uh, if you can also uh, uh, share with us as a city, how do you intend to, to make sure that those things are attended to? And are you including the councillors from other parties as well? Because since the COVID-19, even when we came here for the first time, we ask you if, in terms of your programs as a city, do you include other councillors? Because you know when you govern the city of Cape Town, it does not mean that other councillors who are part and parcel of the council must be, ex must be excluded, especially during these difficult times. That's why now we find... Uh, things such as what's 74 in Hot Bay, uh, people are evicted in the middle. And if you also, I mean, talk to other councillors in the city in order to take an informed decision that will talk to the lives of the people, I think uh, it can be a way forward. The last one, Chair, uh, infrastructure, infrastructure of schools. Uh, now there is a place called Delft in Leiden where the school is flooded and children had to walk in the flood. And there are pictures that are circulating there. I know you'll be saying that, no, it's is, is, is not within your jurisdiction because it's water is, I mean, is the Department of Education that's supposed to take care of those, but it's within your municipality. And if there's a disaster there, you're supposed to come and tell us what is happening because it's an unacceptable situation whereby kids, they have to walk through this uh, such situation. And also, there are reports that are, are not confirmed, but I saw even today on the media to say that number of teachers, they've been tested positive and they keep on contact with kids. So it means that as Cape Town is, a, is, is, a, is an epicenter of COVID-19, since the opening of the school, and I remember very well your MEC was also very welcoming to say that they are ready or you are ready as Cape Town to open schools. But what are you saying, especially as city of Cape Town, with these uh, new reports to say that kids now, through the parents uh, in the form of teachers, are being tested positive? So what is the plan with the city to make sure that there's no, I mean, there's no, people are not getting infected uh, continuously, but there's a cap of this virus. Thank you very much, Chairperson. Thank you so much, Honorable Mkalipi. Uh, Honorable Oberman got uh, disconnected. Can I ask, but she sent through her questions, and ask Honorable Oseni to solely deal with Honorable Oberman's questions now. Uh, yeah. Yes. Don't deal with yours. You will come after my talk. Sure. Gigi, can I ask you to switch off, mute your mic? We are hearing every movement you are doing there. Honorable Mpumza, can you mute your mic, please? Thank you. Over to you, Honorable Hussein, on behalf yeah, uh, of... Chair, thank, of thank you very much. Over. Apologies for uh, Honorable Gisela, Gisela Oppelman. I think she's got some connectivity problems, so... She sent me uh, questions, which I would just uh, put it to the team uh, in the municipality of Cape Town. Uh, there are five questions in total, Chairperson. The first one, uh, she mentions that in your report, um, you, you said that there was a 10 million rand a month for water tankers that was allocated. And what she'd like to know is how will you ensure that there's a more sustainable way of providing a continuous supply of uh, water, taking into account the challenges that you've mentioned on page 13 of your presentation. Then uh, the second question she raises is uh, where and why have you experienced community unrest for the last three months and how will you be in assisting uh, informal settlements going forward? The third question is how will you mitigate against uh, the increased homelessness that's got, likely to develop in the weeks ahead, given the, the poor weather patterns that are starting to develop in the Western Cape. Uh, 
the fourth question is um, how many reconnections has the city done uh, since the lockdown, uh, especially in the last two months, in respect of electricity and water? And there, of course, she's referring to the provision in the regulations that prohibit uh, uh, disconnections of people's water and electricity supply. And uh, at the time of the lockdown and the regulations being released, by that stage, there would have been people who would have been uh, disconnected. And uh, did you reconnect them and how many, if you've got those figures? And then the last question is uh, to the deputy mayor. Um, uh, he mentioned in his presentation that there are national and provincial departments that are not uh, respecting their own constitutional mandates in respect of providing services or uh, providing the money to the municipality. If you could provide more detail and point out which departments those are. Those are the five questions, Shep. Thank you, Honorable Lusen, uh, on behalf of Honorable Opperman. Honorable Shaw. Honorable Shaw. I'll have to skip it and then over to you again, Honorable Lucy. Uh, Chair, thank you very much. Um, I just want to, uh, to, to make just one comment before I just lead with the, the three questions that I would like to raise, Chairperson. And um, I want to just say that, uh, uh, Chair, I'm sure you will agree with me and the rest of the members of the Portfolio Committee will agree with me is that we are, we are all genuinely concerned about uh, the increase in the number of uh, new infections or overall infections in the city of Cape Town. I think it's, a, it's, a, it's probably a concern for you as the municipality and the rest of the people in the country as well. And I would really like to know uh, from the city of Cape Town, in respect of your role, um, you know, to, what do you actually attribute this to? And what exactly are you doing in respect of your mandate as a municipality um, and all of the activities that you are currently involved with uh, provided to you in the regulations and the obligations that you have? Um, what exactly are you doing to try and reduce those um, infections? On the same token, I would like to know, um, you know, why is it that the city of Cape Town, by comparison to other municipalities, the numbers are just massive by comparison to the other municipalities in the country. And I would really like to get an explanation from you. Is it perhaps um, because of the, 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 the work that you're doing that is not being done well enough? I wouldn't like to accuse you of that, but I'd like to give you the opportunity to be able to explain just how is it that your municipality and the numbers are just uh, so much higher by comparison to other municipalities in the country. Then, uh, uh, Chairperson, uh, the, the next question that I have is in relation to uh, uh, the informal settlements, and it's a consistent uh, matter that I raised with other metros that came before the municipality. And I'm sure that uh, uh, the City of Cape Town will appreciate that uh, given the, uh, the density of uh, communities in informal settlements and the difficulties in respect of social distancing, um, I would expect that municipalities would, would take extra measures, make greater investments, put much more effort um, in, in their activities, especially in informal settlements uh, in their municipalities. From the, the information that we pick up already in the media, that it, it's obvious that those figures are growing in a, in, in a number of uh, informal settlements across the country. And the only people that those residents in, in the poorest communities have are people like us, like yourselves, and in the portfolio committee, and those in charge and running government, uh, to protect them? And I'd like to hear from the from from the city of Cape Town. What exactly are you doing to make sure that the numbers in that in those informal settlements um, are reduced, and that you are doing whatever you can in your power to mitigate against that spread? Um, I, I would expect, uh, Chairperson, that there would be an additional. Uh, or extra measure that, that the municipality should be investing in those uh, informal settlements to try and protect the lives of the most vulnerable and the most poor in, in that municipality. 
And the third question, Chairperson, is related to the finances. Um, uh, the Deputy Mayor gave us uh, uh, some good information in respect of his recovery rate and all of that. And I pick up from that that you, you, you say that your, your net, uh, the net effect of the under-recovery is in the region of 2.1 billion rand, which is quite a significant amount of money for a municipality. And I'd like to hear from you, how is that going to affect the municipality going forward in respect of service delivery? And how are you able to balance that budget? And what is it that you've done uh, to make sure that the city is still able to operate and provide the, the necessary basic services that people are, are going to need from you even post, uh, after post-lockdown? Thank you very much, uh, Chairperson. Thank you, Honorable Hussein. Honorable Hadjabe. Honorable Hadjabe. Thank you, thank you, Chairperson. That was quick. Um, no, thank you, Honorable uh, Chairperson. Let me. <laughs> that let was me, quick. Yes, let me take this opportunity and welcome. I will, I will take another ten questions after Adebe because I'm not sure that these questions will be of good quality anyway. <laughs> <laughs> let me take this opportunity and welcome the presentation. Um, from the city of Cape Town. Chair, I must state up front, I think it's for, it's for the second time that the mayor um, is not present before us. Uh, last time, an apology for him. Uh, 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 later on, we realized that he was busy distributing food parcel while he was expected to be here as, as an accounting authority. And today uh, we are not told. We just given an excuse that uh, there's an apology from the executive mayor. But we welcome the second highest in command, uh, Alderman Ian Nielsen, uh, for availing yourself and the MACO members and uh, councillors responsible for, 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 for health to, to be present. Chair, over and above this 20 billion that the national government has put aside and uh, will be made available to municipalities across the country. In terms of the regulation issued uh, uh, by national government, Regulation 399 also requires that municipalities uh, uh, develop a COVID-19 plan. You make resources available for implementation of such a plan and regulation. And Chair, in our last meeting, we did raise our dissatisfaction with the plan that was presented, which was not uh, costed. We then required and requested that uh, give us a detailed plan where each and every program to fight COVID-19 will be costed accordingly. And where you have a shortfall, you indicate as such. The presentation uh, seeks to suggest that uh, you require more funding from national government. We do not have a detailed plan in front of us. Only on slide 11, you indicating a 903 million. You also indicating the 10 million per month for water tanks. Other than that, we do not know uh, uh, this 1.2 billion that will be redirected for COVID-19. Where will that uh, 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 money be used for? So we still require uh, your detailed plan. Last time we were promised that on the 27th of May, uh, you will have a council sitting where the plan will be tabled and, and, and a, a more detail will be forthcoming. We still don't have such. Secondly, um, Honorable Chair, when you appeared, uh, when the city appeared before us, at the time there were six clinics, all of them in the poor and disadvantaged communities that were closed down due to COVID-19 related challenges. Can we get the feedback that all uh, those clinics are fully operational and what steps are, are being taken to ensure that such uh, uh, challenges that uh, arose then will never happen again? Uh, uh, the other challenge uh, that has been raised by the colleagues, which is also uh, uh, part of the regulation, you are required 
by this regulation to make available and identify sites to accommodate homeless people. We have closed down the Strandfontein site. People are scattered all over the city. Others were dumped under the bridge. It has been raining the entire week. I uh, would like to get an understanding why was such a decision taken to close down Strandfontein. We understand the Human Rights Commission uh, 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 outcome, but you are still obliged and requested and required by law to provide shelter for homeless people. When uh, uh, members of parliament went to Strandfontein to do their constitutional oversight duties, they were prohibited from uh, exercising their rights because they were not granted access to the sites. I'd like to get an understanding, perhaps from the city of Cape Town, why would you deny uh, other spheres of government to conduct their effective oversight by denying them access? Uh, uh, I'd like to get an understanding. It is my understanding and the belief, in fact, it's, it's the constitutional uh, requirement of each and every uh, 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 member of parliament to exercise an oversight of rules and responsibility. South Africa is a constitutional democracy. We are a unitary state. We are not a federal state. We don't have rules uh, 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 that are applicable to other spheres of government that do not uh, apply to others. Chair, the, 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 third, the third question, which is a very uh, 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 sensitive matter, that one of how Bay 174, Hangberg, it is not for the first time, Honorable Chair, uh, that this unwarranted eviction is conducted in that particular community under the leadership of the then Madam Mayor, Helen Zim. People were forcefully removed in that area. Some were disabled, others have lost their eyes in the process. Today, uh, 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 people, uh, uh, structures were, were demolished. And the reason given there was that those structures were unoccupied. It can't be correct, it can't be true. Otherwise, police wouldn't have resorted in using force and unleash rubber bullets to unarmed, uh, uh, peaceful and hopeless uh, uh, residents. There were rubber bullets flying. Yet the regulations are unequivocal and clear. No eviction may be conducted under the state of national disaster. You have done it uh, in, in, in what, 94? The court declared your conduct unlawful. You are doing it again in what, 74? I'd like to get a sense and understanding. Why is city completely and it seems as if in a defiant way disregarding the regulations, that of prohibiting uh, uh, forceful evictions during the state of, 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 of disaster. Honorable Chair, we also received reports, and I'll put it as allegation at this point in time, and we'd like to get an, 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 an view to afford the city, that the, there was a five million that was approved for food parcel uh, to the tune of 7,400. Uh, yet the distribution of those food parcel is not clear. Uh, we are told, I have a constituency office in Kailicha. I know for a fact that majority of uh, awards in Kailicha, what councillors there were only given 30 food parcels. What was the distribution uh, uh, mechanism that was utilized to distribute food parcel in all city of Cape Town wards, were all wards given 30 food parcel as it was the case in Kaili, Chakukule, to Philippi and other poor and, 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 and black township. Secondly, Chair, the other disturbing aspect is the 8.4 million tender uh, awarded to supply 200,000 face masks. Now, if you do maths, it simply means an approximately 50 rand per mask. Is that really a value for money to spend more than 50 rand on a face mask? Can you safely 
and proudly tell the residents of Cape Town and this community that the tender of uh, uh, supplying this face mask, it's, it's, it, did you receive any value for money? Uh, uh, where you have uh, approximately 50 rand per face mask. To me, Chair, that does not uh, 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 make sense. I am not uh, convinced at all uh, that it, it warrants and it justifies uh, uh, spending so much money on, on, on the face mask. The other aspect that I would like to get clarity on, uh, the regulation once again uh, request and require of the municipalities to mitigate in the spread of the COVID-19 by ensuring enforcement uh, of this regulation. Uh, uh, Kailicha is becoming the, 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 the epicenter. What are the measures in place uh, to ensure the enforcement of these regulations? Over and above the expectation of national government and provincial government, I know uh, uh, the old argument by the city that when it comes to crime and security, it's the, 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 the mandate that is uh, done by the national government and province. But within the city of Cape Town, in fact, all municipalities, you have what we call the crime prevention plan, and you have a directorate responsible for safety and security. Hence, the regulations uh, demand and require of you to put measures in place to ensure that you minimize the spread. Can you uh, 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 enlighten us in relation to measures in place especially in, in, in overpopulated areas, your Kailicha, your Mitchell's Plain, your Haut Bay, Mfule, Ninyanga. What made, because when, even when it was still level five, you would drive up and down there. It was business as usual. You would not even identify a single uh, 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 metropolis and law enforcement agencies. Once in a while, you, you would have them uh, uh, driving up and down, but there, were, there was no enforcement. We are on level three. We are still under lockdown. I would like to get an understanding, Chair. Let me, for now, with an understanding that we'll have enough time to go for second round, because I don't want to make this my, my, my meeting, Chair. I have a lot of issues to, to, to raise. But let me pause and, and, and take water, I will come back for the next, for the next round, time permitting and uh, 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 as the chair may allow us to have another round. Thank you. Uh, Honourable Flo, thank you, Honourable. <coughs> Is Honourable Flo ready oh, now? Oh, yeah, yes, okay. Can you hear me, chair? Yes, okay. Yes, thank you, chairperson. Can you put your camera on? Yes, and I'm also want to see. Can you put this your video on, please? Okay. Yes. Uh, thank you, Chairperson. Uh, let me firstly welcome the presentation by the Deputy Mayor, and also appreciate their. Uh, effective working in their municipalities, but not being happy. The issue of eviction of people during this 19 and during this winter, and also the issue of uh, Cape Town being the epicenter of uh, this pandemic, COVID-19. It was really not fair to our people. What is your urgent intervention measures did you put in place in making sure that you urgently make sure that those people get uh, back to where they were staying and also make sure that uh, if you have people, meaning those people, they don't have any place to stay, meaning they don't have even the food for them to eat. So I think also the eviction of, of taking them back, it will also be followed by the food parcels. Then the people living uh, at backyard, 
I think this is really unacceptable anywhere in the world. Because why Cape Town is always impossible for accommodating our own people in their own country so that they can have a better place to stay. But here you are impressing us that you are doing well, while at the same time you are not 100% doing well. The issue of, then you can see about, when we were talking about the water tankers reticulation that you were spending 10,000 or, or 10 million per month, what is it that you are doing? Is there any problem of you spending that money for, for water tankers? Or did you have any mechanism that you are going to put in place in making sure that everybody gets uh, a clean water as uh, uh, for the sake of their health hazard? Then the issue of uh, not updating us about the quarantine site of how many beds, of how many places of the quarantine, that what steps have you taken in making sure that all those people that are being affected, uh, they are getting a, a safety PPEs, then we can also get an understanding what most people have lost there. And, and then also, we are also talking about the issue of the people that they've lost their job. That can we also get an understanding that most people that have lost jobs, what measures did you put in place that you develop a program that can accommodate those people who lost their properties and help them to fill in in different form so that they should be able to be accommodated somewhere. And also the issue of uh, food parcels. What is your agent intervention on that? Could you please just clarify and so that we can be in line of what is it that is happening? Then again, that the current level of access to service delivery will leave an accurate picture of what is happening with institutions of finance in our municipalities. Is there any, uh, uh, maybe, is there any sufficient information readily available which will uh, allow us in this quick, to have a quick look and check what leads to the infrastructure expenditure grant that were reported that they were below 30%, namely water service infrastructure grant, the, you know, the regional bank infrastructure, the national electrification program, a neighborhood development and, uh, and partnership uh, grant and municipal energy housing grant and the municipal disaster grant because we have never mentioned about that. If you have mentioned, maybe I didn't hear you, but I was sitting here listening very attentively. The issue of the municipalities across the, the various categories that uh, they continue to underreport against their conditional ground. Could you please just share with us what is it that is happening in your municipality? Because here I can see that you only put things that you are doing well, but while at the same time, there are so many things that are need an answer which you really you didn't uh, and then uh, focus more on those issues because uh, uh, I don't know what is it that you are doing. And then there are so many things that have been covered by uh, my colleagues uh, I think yeah, because I've written so many things but now because of uh, my colleagues have taken so many questions otherwise I'm happy and then uh, uh, the issue of the to finalize the allocation of 20 billion uh, to local government. That one, it will be there, but also you need also, yeah, you know, you are alone for 20 billion. It should also be uh, uh, in line with uh, what is it that is needed agency for city so that uh, when they, they allocate those funds, they should be able to know what is it that they are going to allocate that money for.
uh, Chairperson, I think uh, for now, I thank you. Thank you so much, Honorable Go. Mine is a short one. The colleagues have already dealt with most of the issues that one wanted to raise. Uh, we have seen the city uh, engage in various litigation uh, with, with relation to this national disaster regulations. The first matter, you remember the city versus employment in formal settlements on the illegal evictions, which the court ruled in favor of the citizens. Can Mam Tos mute your mic, please? Another book for mute your mic. Okay. Thank you. So we wanted to understand um, also the issue with regard to you took also the South African Human Rights Commission to court in relation to their report on the strand contain a a a a shelter. And then also the the judge uh, was very scatty on you. Can you update us on that one? This one is in line with the issues that have been raised by the colleagues to say uh, after the establishment of the of that shelter, we don't see anything in your report as to how many shelters does the city have and then uh, where are they and how many people are there. There's no, we don't see anything there. That leads me to the issue that we know you have then uh, redirected your funds and created a fund of 1.2 billion in response to the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. Can you share with us the details of the, that business plan that supported this uh, redirection of the funds? What does it entail? Because for me, where I'm seated, it will be addressing all these issues that the colleagues are raising if it's a proper business plan. So, so those are the issues that one wanted to raise with yourselves. Uh, the rest, I should think, the colleagues have covered them. Over to you, Deputy Naya Nelson and the team. Honorable Chair? Yes. Um, can, can I add two two quick issues? You no, I have a second round. Let I think they are coming so much. To work okay. All the questions. No, thanks. I'm going to give members second round of all no the problem. questions. No problem. Over to you, Deputy Mayor and Team Cape Town. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. So uh, there were a whole range of questions, and many of those questions overlap with each other. Uh, let me also say that um, quite often uh, the members uh, said something along the lines of, well, the, uh, you did not do this, you did not say that, you did not give us this information. Well, Madam Chair, if you only give us 15, 20 minutes, then it's impossible for us to give such detailed information. Uh, if, if you require those kind of detailed reports, we are willing to do it, but you must uh, then permit us something like two hours to be able to come and give you a full uh, description of all of these things. And we would then also need to understand uh, ahead of time in a detailed way. Uh, perhaps if we got the questions ahead of time, we would be able to uh, give these uh, in detail. So uh, the presentation we did was what fitted in the time. Uh, and uh, gave the outline of those issues, uh, but we will now uh, proceed to to deal with these questions as fully as we can. Uh, I will I will speak to some of them, uh, and I will then uh, allow my colleagues to add to what I have to say. So, um, uh, first uh, member, Honourable Gaba. Uh, said that in Google Letter, not all services. Well, you know, um, uh, in Cape Town, the level of services are very high. Uh, the, the member should be careful not to, um, not to believe his own party's propaganda. 
let's get back to the facts of what's actually available. We know that the level of services uh, are on all of those are very high across the whole of Cape Town, uh, including all of the poor areas. We know it's not perfect. There are places that continue to require uh, further services. We have in place very detailed plans on every service from water to sanitation to roads uh, to electricity. All of these um, have detailed plans for, for uh, provision to ensure that people uh, get access. So on water, it's something like 99% of households have a direct access to potable water. So, I mean, some of the questions that we've had tonight around water tankers uh, have not taken into account the fact that, that we already have such a very high level of provision uh, across the city. Uh, and, you know, claims that uh, water pressures are, 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 are very high in rich parts of the city and, and very low in poor areas. We dispute that completely. Uh, there, is, there's, there are sometimes uh, local problems. Uh, when we're aware of them, we deal with them. Uh, but as a general uh, statement, that is simply not true. And uh, if, if uh, members... Uh, want to dispute that, then I must request you to please provide me with, with precisely where these places are, um, and we will investigate them. So then let me deal broadly with this issue of, of eviction, which uh, whole, uh, many members raised. Let me make it clear, uh, we have not gone against the regulations. We have not evicted people that were in houses before the shutdown started. But what we have seen in the city uh, has been very uh, politically motivated invasion of land. People who have attempted to use this period of the shutdown uh, as, as a way to, uh, to get uh, to invade, uh, to illegally evade land, to set up structures, uh, and uh, to to use this as an opportunity to achieve their political uh, objectives. Well, we are not going to allow that. Uh, it is not appropriate uh, and and acceptable for such such opportunistic uh, political actions. Uh, so we we have only dealt. It's not been evictions of people that are already in place. It's been a dealing with a legal invasion. And what has happened today uh, in Hart Bay, and uh, uh, Honorable Khadebi referred to it, and he said he didn't believe it, but I'm afraid it is true, and I will repeat it. That, first of all, let me say that what happened today in Hart Bay was carried out by SAPS. It was a, a South African police services who carried out the operation in Hart Bay. Uh, it was under their control, but what was dealt with were incomplete structures and structures that were not uh, uh, that were not didn't have people living in them. So there were no evictions because no one was living in those structures. And let me say it is the local Hungberg community that requested action against these illegal structures. So uh, you know one must be very careful uh, of of accepting the statements of, of certain individuals who, again, try to use uh, the, the current conditions to drive some kind of political message, and then they break the law in doing so, and they try to be make it a uh, belief that, that we are breaking the law when they are the ones who are breaking the law. So let's, let's be very clear on that, and uh, the city is not going to apologize for dealing with illegal invasion of property. Uh, we recognize property rights, and we will continue to recognize property rights of people and uphold those. And we will ensure that uh, where the illegal invasions, uh, invasions continue, that we will act against it. And let me say we are not the only municipalities done this. Many other municipalities across the country have been doing that. Uh, uh, other metros as well uh, throughout this uh, throughout this period of lockdown uh, and, and the various steps that have been there. So 
uh, be careful where you point your finger because there's always three fingers pointing back in another direction. On, on, the, on a, on a, on a, so, Madam Chair, on a, um, order. on a point of order. On a point of order, Chair. Let me hear the order. The point Let, of order. Chair, I, 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 I've been very patient and disciplined in, uh, in listening to um, Alderman Ian Nelson. But one can accept uh, 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 certain things to a certain point. I, 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 I think it's correct to say these are politically motivated issues. Time and again, and telling us we must be careful when pointing fingers because others are pointing at us. He knows very well that the area that I'm referring to in Haupe, even I was still a, 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 a PR counselor in that era. I was deployed there for more than seven years. Those structures were occupied. If those structures were not occupied and they were not complete, police wouldn't have used the rubber bullets. The, it was not only types that was there. There were city officials, law enforcement agents yeah. as well. These people yeah. were given mandate by the city officials to go there yeah. and eat yeah. people. Please, can you not insult our intelligence? We are appealing to you. When we raised this question, we did not insult you. Please, I'm, I'm, I'm asking you nicely. There is nothing politically motivated in this I question. You've made, you have made your point, yes? So, Madam Chair, I... On a point of order, Chair. On a point of order, Chair. On a point of order, Chair. Okay, good, Please, please, uh, uh, Deputy Mayor, do not uh, delve or, or attempt to try and patronize us by, by mentioning party propaganda. Because you standing there, you know that you are from a political party. We are speaking to issues of yes. people affecting yes. people. There is no political organization here. We are colleagues here. We are members of parliament. So don't come with that... With, with, with that with that, with that kind of... of, of, of with the of, tendency here. Yeah. With, with the that tendency. tendency. Tell him. Don't come with that thing oh, here. Oh, oh, we, are oh, all, we are all here as members of parliament. And you can judge us on that. You can't bring those things and come and patronize us here and tell us about party propaganda. Because yourself, you are, you are there. You are, you, are, you are promoting your party propaganda. So, okay. so one, I'll speak to the presentation and the limitations that we are speaking to, the details that we are asking are not in the presentation. So provide us, don't tell us about time and all those things. You know the details. As a, by virtue of you being a deputy a, 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 a mayor, you must know it. That's what you do. That's what you are paid for. Thank you, Chair. Okay. Uh, can I assist uh, deputy mayor? Can you focus on responding to the questions as raised? Yeah? Don't go off the tangent and talk politics. Let's look at the question again, then we won't have problem. Can we move along those lines, Deputy Mayor? You respond where there are no responses, don't point fingers to say the fingers pointing at the left because here we are not in the game of politics. Collectively, I will tell you, even with members of your own party who are members of this committee. We are just doing what we are supposed to do, oversight over your good selves. As the committee, lead committee responsible for the National Disaster Management Act. The Disaster Management Act, we are the custodian. So whatever we are asking here is in line, in response. That's why we said, come and brief us on your response to this COVID-19 as declared a disaster by the president and the minister of culture. So don't go off the tangent. That's why then we see tempers uh, rising. Uh, 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 you see how the colleagues are responding. Just be direct, respond to questions. And I know you've got nothing to hide. So just focus on responding to the questions. Then we want to plead with you, Deputy Mayor, so that you do that. Please. Thank you, Madam Chair. I, I will uh, attempt my best to do so, but let me just say that I only responded uh, in the same way that the questions were posted to me, uh, with the same kind with the, that 
uh, the way the questions I also experienced uh, as being a political well, attack. Problem. So, so, so you can say that, and then I will get on with the get on with these questions, Madam Chair. Leza, would you respect? Uh, uh, can I plead with you again, uh, uh, Councillor Nelson, Alderman? Please, just respond to the questions. You know, as questions are asked, they need feedback. Otherwise, we won't be having this session. And I'll plead with you. Don't. Uh, there's no question that is political. I can assure you on that one as well. There's no question that is political. Like I'm saying, as this committee, we work collectively. You may never even see somebody. That's why even your own party members ask you questions that they think they need to be responded. So take it in good faith. This is a committee of parliament that is actually doing its oversight role. And then just respond where you've got answers and you must be reminded you are in a committee of parliament so that I won't be able to de deal with this intervention that keep on coming. Uh, I, I, I'm pleading with you, uh, Alderman Nelson, That's so fine, that you Madam focus Chair. on Shosho. Sure, sure. Thank you. I've made my point. I've made my point. Thank you. Oh, so, no. okay, you see, so uh, Madam Chair, uh, <laughs> the question that was asked... There is no uh, remorse uh, there. There is no remorse so, Let's see. Alderman, my point. Alderman Ian Nelson, if that's how you used to conduct your council meeting and bulldoze other political parties, you can do that here. We are in fact. You keep your bulldoze. That's of the time. Not the best time we are dealing with with presentations. You are the only municipality that is asked to do this. You all the other. Can you then raise your hands if you want to talk? My to do what my you're doing. My okay? apology. Yes, please, please. Apology. Can I plead with you? Okay. You I know the process here. Let's give him a benefit of doubt for the next time. I understand the anger and the frustration that is going through here, yeah? but I think uh, uh, maybe let me hear you, uh, Pumza. What is your point? Let me leave these two colleagues who are emotional now a bit. Okay? Because, uh, uh, Pumza, you will come. Can you? I wanted to appeal to honor member. I wanted to appeal to honorable members. Uh, I think uh, they have raised their concerns, their views. Let's allow the mayor now to get in and uh, respond to questions so that we have time for follow-ups. Yes. And they will do so now politely, mindful of what the colleagues have said. Can we allow the honorable mayor to proceed? Deputy Mayor. Thank you, Madam Chair. <clears throat> So the questions around uh, around water and that I will leave. Uh, Alderman uh, Limburg will deal with those uh, when I'm finished, uh, and I'll deal with uh, some of the other questions. Um, so let me say there was a question uh, from uh, uh, Honourable Keza around Witzenberg. Let me say Witzenberg is not part of the city of Cape Town, uh, so uh, we are not in a position to respond to that. Uh, and then the question around is there adequate housing? Well, the, the, the point is that there is not adequate housing in the city. We all know that in all the cities in this country and, and including Cape Town. So, uh, and I reflect also on the other question that was posed to me uh, when I made the comment in my presentation about those uh, national departments that do not fulfill their mandate and then it falls on the, the shoulders of local government. Housing is spectacularly one of those where uh, it is the constitutional responsibility of the national government to provide housing, not that of local authorities. We do so only as agents uh, for, uh, for the national government. But the, the extent of funding provided for housing is so low that we are not able to provide that. We, uh, 
we have projects available, we would be able to do far more if uh, the resources were made available to us. Uh, so uh, that's that's simply factual, and I and I will speak to some others as we go through. Uh, the question that was put around uh, the plan to cushion the loss of jobs. So this is a range of issues here. Uh, clearly, the, the main thing is that we need to get the economy going again because it's only by getting the economy going again uh, that you get the jobs back and that people have income because that's the only way you can do it at scale. Uh, what government is able to provide will never be, be able to replace uh, getting the economy going again. But being able to cushion it uh, was exactly why we focused so strongly uh, on the issue of poor people and, uh, and assisting them. So financially, um, the city has a, uh, a very strong uh, uh, process in place, has always had a process in place, of, of provision of services to poor households. Uh, and that that costs around 3 billion rand a year. Now, uh, that is already in place, so we, uh, we were able to, to expand on, on that, uh, making sure that people have basic services, because, again, this comes back to the issue of the constitutional responsibilities of local government. That is our responsibility. We... There's, there's not a, a, a responsibility uh, for, for major social intervention other than through our services that we provide. However, uh, again, because, uh, and coming back to the question of the failure uh, of national organizations, uh, SASA failed to provide the food as it should have done to our communities uh, during this lockdown period. Uh, the support uh, that that was their priority. So we have stepped in uh, beyond our own uh, 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 constitutional mandate to assist uh, those, uh, those communities as far as we could uh, with the limited resources that we would have available uh, for that purpose. And so the mayor made that a, a strong uh, a priority of his, uh, ensuring that that food uh, was distributed as, as broadly as we could within our limited means. Um, and there were questions around where were these di distributed. Um, uh, I did not know. I would need to answer that question, but I, we will be able to provide you uh, with with a detailed um, uh, information around that. Uh, so the the question then from uh, was also around what regulations were limiting performance. So my comments were not related only to uh, the uh, the COVID nineteen regulations, but to broadly government regulations that are in place. So we've had a particular problem, for example, uh, with uh, SEM regulations uh, and their local content requirements that are so tight that it makes it very, very difficult uh, to, to, do, uh, to, to put contracts together uh, that don't fall foul of that because uh, even a minor little thing like a tap uh, could fall fall foul of of, of these regulations. So uh, while we we support the broad ideas, it's simply a question of saying, can these regulations be drafted in a way that are more uh, that pr provide uh, for for greater flexibility uh, in achieving the objectives that are that are sought uh, uh, in these cases. Um, The, the issue about, um, about the uh, quarantine sites, uh, I respectively, uh, my colleagues, uh, uh, Councillor Badruddin will speak to that. 
but respectfully that is priority the key priority there is the uh, the provincial government and i think you would need to to request them to speak to you on it we have ever from the city uh done a great deal in terms of making uh city uh, sites available uh and we've we've carried out full investigation of possibility possibility for such sites and have made those available to the provincial government uh and i'm sure my my colleague will be able to expand on that so uh um, councillor uh, sorry my apologies the honorable um carla believe me um ask questions or to explain issues around uh the collection rates and ask to to be to explain some of the the data uh between april and may so yes in may there was in some cases an improved collection uh from april but the real comparison needs to be made is to that of march because march was um essentially before the lockdown even though the last week was within the lockdown um it was uh, uh it was uh, in 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 april that we saw the fall off in collection uh from around about 95% to to around 77% overall that was the fall off now if you compare that to the data that was published yesterday by uh the banks the fall off of uh, bank transactions in this this period was about 20% so this tied in very closely with with that i think is a good indication uh in april we had a, a small uptick but it was very um uh, it, it was almost the same it was, there was not much difference really the question around where we assisting people with loans no we would we we may not the, the the law is clear local authorities may not assist people with loans and that's the point that we were making uh the some of the requests that have been made by the public for assistance in this period uh would uh, would effectively be loans to the public and therefore we were not in a position to do so uh we focused very strongly precisely on the people that that were most affected uh, in this period who lost their jobs it's those who have lost their income whether they lost their jobs or whatever their income sources were uh they are the ones that we focused on on providing uh a benefit to so for if anyone now no longer has an income of less than 7000 rand a month they can qualify for the indigent benefit um and uh they would then uh, be able to uh to get all the benefits uh of of the rates rebates uh of access to to cheaper uh tariffs and so on that are available in our in our indigent uh policy we also changed the requirement where previously it required 3 months uh, uh of uh, of income to to prove that to only be one month so you can essentially uh immediately if you've lost your job or lost your income come to the municipality uh and and seek to uh to be qualified uh, for that um the question that was raised around flooding at the school in delft um i'm afraid i do not have a, a, a an answer to that uh i would have to uh request uh that 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 information be obtained uh and again as the, the honorable member said um any if the flooding was on the school properties i think you would have to speak to the the provincial government on that equally your questions around uh the impact on the opening of schools uh again that's beyond uh our mandate uh so again i think respectfully that you uh direct those questions uh, to the provincial government um so the questions around increased homelessness 
Uh, well, we don't have exact numbers on on homelessness. We have, I think, we have a really a reasonably good idea around that. And perhaps my my colleague, uh, Councillor Badruddin, will be able to speak to that uh, in more detail. But the fact is, we have a number of sites across the city uh, uh, for homeless people, and they're not full. There is spare capacity at those places. So anyone who's claiming that they that they're not being accommodated, well, there is space for them, uh, and uh, we recommend that they uh, go to one of the shelters. Uh, and Alderman Lindbergh could perhaps speak to the issue of the reconnections that have taken place uh, in the in the last few months. So other questions around the impact of national government departments that have failed to to come to the party. Let me speak first of all to the issue of the refugees in the city. The refugees is not a local government function. It's not our responsibility. It is the responsibility of national government departments. They have completely neglected the position of these refugees despite us raising it with them uh, many times. Um, and equally, around all the issues around the homeless, again, national government departments who are responsible for social services have not been seen anywhere. We have been required, the only ones who have come to the party, to, to seek to assist uh, homeless people. Uh, and equally in the health uh, uh, area, um, the city... Uh, runs over a hundred uh, cl clinics in the city. It is not a local government function. We have to, out of our own funds, contribute around 700 million rand a year to run in that health uh, health operation. That is not our responsibility. Uh, so this is yet another case of it's an unfunded mandate that we continue to have, and that. And now in these circumstances, these current circumstances, the burden uh, are on that uh, primary health care uh, facilities is even higher and we have significant additional costs. Uh, my, my colleague, uh, uh, Councillor Badruddin, will speak to the issue of the increase in infections. Um, and the extra measures that have been put in place. So, uh, Honourable Hussain's question around the uh, 2.1 billion rand shortfall that I had reflected there and what that impact is uh, on on the city. Well, it uh, in in sh in short. It means that money that could be used for other purposes now must be moved to to fulfill that 2.1 billion rand hole that would otherwise be in place. So if there's a if there is a a, a place where uh, the national government can uh, can assist, uh, it would be to to assist the the city to to fulfill that shortfall so that. Uh, we do not have an impact uh, on on any of the other services that we need to provide uh, to the people on the ground. Uh, Honorable Khadebi's uh, questions. Uh, he referred to the 20 billion rand that we have we have not seen yet, uh, and he asked about our COVID-19 plan. Well, I. I I'm informed that that COVID-19 plan was presented in detail at your previous meeting. He said, is it costed? Yes, it is costed. Uh, and as I've said, we summarized in our presentation, it's 2.1 billion rand is the impact. We do have the breakdown of that, and uh, we will be able to provide you with that that breakdown. Uh, Councillor Badruddin will speak to the issue of the clinics that had been closed. Uh, and also to the issues around Strandfontein, um, around that. But let me just 
just say that question that was uh, it was posed to us about had we denied access uh, well it, what essentially we did where, where we were properly approached beforehand so that we could arrange uh, for for access uh, to uh, to elected officials uh, including members of parliament we'd be happy to do that Unfortunately, what happened quite often is that groups turned up, uh, the people who, who were responsible for ensuring security at that site. And let me say it was important to have security at the site, again, by because we were concerned about infection uh, and impact on, on the people that were staying there, but we couldn't simply let anybody in. Uh, and it would appear that that quite often groups turned up. We did not know uh, whether who these people were. They may have been members of parliament, but uh, having not uh, been planned prior to that, uh, it, it was really impossible uh, simply to allow anyone who, who turns up uh, to, to get access onto the site. Uh, I've spoken to the issue of the food parcels. We will give you more detail, Moss, on uh, uh, information on that. Uh, Arnold Khadebi's question around the face marks. Uh, the, the Chief Financial Officer, Mr. Kevin Jacoby, will respond to that when I'm finished. Um, I understand these were the, the masks that uh, the high, the high quality masks that are used by by health uh, by health people. It's not the normal masks uh, that are used by by the average uh, person. The question around social distance enforcement in Kailicha, and again, I have to come back to the the issue of failure of of national departments. Um, South African police services in Kailicha have been dramatically cut over the years. We all know about this. There was a court case around this matter um, and that the numbers there have been significantly reduced. And it was the South African police services who were the, the prime responsibility for, for enforcing these regulations and issues such as social distance. Uh, the city uh, provided resources where it could. Um, but we should not uh, deny the the uh, the failure of of the key and primary uh, organisation uh, who uh, who did not uh, fulfil their responsibilities. Um, Chair, your questions. Um, around the the court issues uh, let me say that the issue with the human rights uh, South African Human Rights Council we've always made it clear that we did not have a problem with with the council carrying out their responsibilities unfortunately they had appointed monitors who were not members of of the uh, Human Rights Commission um, who simply turned up at Strandfontein uh, again um, uh, attempted to interfere uh, with the operations there created a dangerous situation that was our concern again we had no problem where uh, the the members of the Human Rights Commission uh, made uh, made uh, the uh, plans with us to, to, to visit the site. They were given access to the site. It was these monitors who came up every day and who, who sought to, to interfere with operations who created the problem, and that was the issue that we went to court on. Um, the, the issue in the court now is that the matter is moot because the Strandfontein site has been closed down. Um, and we were then happy to uh, to, to uh, do away with that. Um, but uh, 
so uh, unfortunately the Human Rights Commission wanted to continue with that case and uh, so it continued. We now wait for the judge's uh, decision on the matter. Uh, I hope, uh, well, I think, uh, Madam Man Chair, if I can then ask my colleagues um, to respond and then we can see if we have covered all, all the bases. So if I could ask first uh, Alderman Limburg to respond to the questions around water. And you will be followed by uh, Mr. Webster and uh, Mr. Mdondo on water related questions. Councillor Lindbergh. Thank you, Madam Chairperson, and thank you to all of the members of the committee for the questions. It uh, permits me the opportunity to perhaps clarify um, and give a little bit more detail uh, in respect to my introductory remarks. Um, when I started off chairperson, um, I mentioned that the city's informal settlement basic services COVID-19 um, response plan uh, focused on three priority areas. One, maintain, maintaining and enhancing uh, existing water and sanitation services within existing informal settlements. These settlements are roughly uh, close to 500 informal settlements that are uh, permanently serviced either through uh, toilets um, and taps as well as receiving regular um, solid waste removal services and many of these are also electrified. Uh, as the Deputy Mayor pointed out, uh, the City of Cape Town is recognized as having the highest access to basic services uh, within our informal settlements and this is not based on our own data but uh, other institutions such as Stats SA and other organizations have confirmed this. And so that's what Priority One essentially focuses on. We also have janitorial services that provides cleaning and cleansing services. This has been enhanced as part of Priority One. Priority Two looks at uh, or includes emergency provision of temporary services to uh, settlements that are either unserviced or where there is limited services. These are generally newer settlements um, formed due to recent unlawful la land occupation uh, where communities have settled on land that is not suitable for habitation. Um, and this is what Mr. Lars Mdondo's presentation spoke to. Uh, this is inclusive of the water tankers or water trucks. There are 27 of these. Um, that are providing daily water delivery services to 173 informal settlements. In addition to that, as part of Priority 2, we have also had two phases of water tank installation. The first phase comprised of 93 water tanks. This was fully funded by the City of Cape Town. And the second phase uh, was inclusive of um, 214 water tanks provided by the National Department of Water and Sanitation. We have been collaborating with the National Department of Water and Sanitation um, quite successfully in relation to the implementation of this particular program. Um, as part of the tank installation program, uh, we have had to revise our initial list of 60 informal settlements to four. This is based on space cons constraints and where we haven't been able to install water tanks, these com um, communities are still serviced on a day-to-day -day basis through the delivery of water via our water tankers or water trucks. Um, and so I think the committee can feel rest assured that we are not in any way disregarding uh, any particular community, all of these um, communities are being serviced during this period of time uh, through these temporary and emergency measures. The City of Cape Town in its budget um, council meeting uh, a few weeks ago as part of its new um, financial year budget 2020-2021 has set aside a further two, just over 200 million rand towards um, 
priority two, uh, which is the emergency services, Here's as well as found. as well as the um, existing um, services, which we render on a day-to-day basis to close to 500 informal settlements. And then priority three um, was uh, inclusive of the additional health and hygiene measures which we are implementing. Um, and this is a multi-departmental uh, program which we do with the City Health Department as well as other role players. Um, this uh, particular area of focus, priority three, Um, includes things such as community awareness uh, campaigns, driving messages through um, sharing best hygienic uh, practices. Um, We have done loud hailing tours um, as part of Priority 3. And so I hope that then clarifies the issue around uh, the priority areas which many of the committee members raised. Um, There was questions and concerns about the cost uh, both operational and capital, and how will we aim to reduce that cost in the long run to ensure a more sustainable and continuous and affordable supply of services to informal settlements. Um, the city does intend on connecting uh, where it is feasible, uh, water, the water tanks to the formal water reticulation um, infrastructure, and this will definitely reduce the operational costs Um, Settlements that have not been able to receive a tanker will also be uh, potentially receiving um, stand pipes or taps, and there is a process underway to investigate that. That will also then minimize um, the operational and capital cost in relation to uh, additional water tankers or the delivery of water through the water trucks. Which are, which is currently, um, costing the city about 200,000 rand a day, as I've indicated. Um, I think that the deputy mayor has touched on some of the other points, uh, around certain, certain settlements. Um, but maybe just to also elaborate on the fact that, uh, the provision of water to the 173, um, informal settlements, either through the tanks or the trucks. Um, Obviously, there is a significant amount of effort that's going towards this. We ensure that water is um, of SANS 241 drinking quality standards. There are a number of control measures being put in place to ensure all health and safety um, compliance requirements are met. Our staff have been trained as well to ensure that they also adhere to all of the necessary um, health and social distancing um, requirements as part of uh, COVID-19 measures. So we can also uh, inform and confirm to the committee members that all of these services are also being um, provided with uh, complete awareness and consciousness around the need to ensure that we limit any spread of of infections within these vulnerable communities. Some of the committee members uh, wanted to understand uh, what some of the protest action um, and other logistical challenges uh, entailed. Um, Many of the protest actions which took place uh, during this lockdown period, which prevented um, the continuous servicing of certain areas, was largely around um, access to food, uh, where we saw uh, communities um, stoning or damaging vehicles to access food and other resources. So those are some of the um, protest action that limited our ability to access certain areas. Uh, We also had um, unfortunate criminal um, elements um, such as uh, our officials and our service providers um, being attacked, robbed, um, attempts to hijack uh, the vehicles as well. Um, And we did reach out to community members during this time. Um, Many of them were of great assistance. but this hasn't always prevented um, 
criminal attacks uh, or incidents or criminal elements from targeting our staff and our service providers. Um, we obviously monitor this on an ongoing basis, um, and we try and ensure that we put alternative measures in place to ensure that residents are not severely impacted, and wherever possible, um, services are re resumed um, almost immediately. Um, and then I think it's important also just to point out that uh, to date, we have been able to, as Mr. Mdondo said, uh, deliver over 41 million litres uh, of water to date through the installation of the tanks and the water tankers. Um, we obviously expect that number to increase um, as we now have completed phase two of the project. Um, there were issues raised around um, flooding, and specifically Morikana was mentioned. I think it's important to note that Morikana is a settlement um, that is located on private land, multiple private owners. Uh, it is a flood-prone area, and during this period, our disastrous management as well as our informal settlements management departments do respond to uh, providing relief um, in different forms. Uh, but prior to the rainy season starting, the city also has a winter readiness program. This is once again a transversal uh, program that looks at trying to ensure we remove uh, any um, potential uh, matter that could uh, constrict and cause flooding. Um, so this is a program that's also focused around ensuring that we assist informal settlements to prepare for uh, rain and flooding. And our response teams operate on a 24-hour basis to assist communities who are in need during this time. There were questions um, around water and electricity reconnections. Um, or disconnections. I think I just want to firstly point out that the city of Cape Town doesn't um, disconnect water supply. Uh, we restrict water um, supply uh, for debt purposes. Um, and this restriction essentially allows a resident to receive around 750 uh, liters of water per day at 2.4 2.4 uh, bar pressure. Uh, this is the minimum pressure in the city. In most parts of the city, the pressure is far higher than that. So residents who are restricted for debt purposes uh, would still receive uh, an allocation of about 750 liters per day. But we suspended uh, restrictions in relation to both water and electricity for debt um, purposes in mid-March before the lockdown commenced um, and we have been assisting residents um, who have reached out to the city um, for full uh, reconnection or full supply of water um, or unrestricted supply of water and the city has been incredibly flexible in um, making the necessary arrangements. Um, I don't have the exact uh, data with me in relation to how many uh, water and electricity reconnections have been made since the lockdown commenced in March, but I am willing to commit myself to provide that to the committee um, and so that they have oversight also of the efforts that the city has made um, to ensure that residents are not in any way um, limited from access to water. Um, and then I just wanted to add to uh, the points that Alderman Nielsen had raised in relation to uh, the enforcement efforts in Kailicha and point out to the committee that the city of Cape Town has reinforced the national COVID-19 regulations um, and the national police minister has actually acknowledged that the city and the province have uh, implemented these regulations far more diligently than anywhere else in South Africa. 
It is for this reason that we have the highest number of fines in relation to uh, the current regulations, and I think that shows our commitment towards ensuring that social distancing and other measures are adhered to and that there is general compliance. Um, within the area of Kailicha specifically, there have been multiple loud hailing um, events with the disaster risk management uh, officials and other departments um, and staff have visited taxi ranks and transport interchanges within this area. They've also assisted with uh, enforcement at supermarkets um, as part of uh, their efforts to ensure that there is general compliance. And these efforts have been uh, multiplied across um, different parts of the city that have been identified as hotspots or so-called epicenters. Um, there was one point raised by one of the committee members um, in relation to backyarders. Um, I want to point out that the city of Cape Town is the only city um, that I'm aware of that has a backyarder service upgrade program, uh, and this um, provides an inclusive set of basic services to backyarders that are on city uh, rental property. Um, and that's an ongoing program um, to ensure that there's access. We obviously are not permitted to install uh, services on private property. Um, and where there is settlements that are on private property, we provide services to the best of our ability. But this is usually uh, on the periphery of the property uh, as legislation requires. Um, Chairperson, for now, I think that covers... Um, most of the um, issues, just one more point um, with regards to uh, water restrictions. Um, the figure that I mentioned um, that relates to uh, how much water our residents receive when they are restricted for debt purposes, uh, this amount is far above what the World Health Organization um, sets out as a health requirement, um, and so I think that furthermore shows the city's dedication um, to ensure that we have a caring and sensitive approach around how we render basic services. Thank you very much. If I can ask then uh, Councillor Badruddin to speak. Okay, over to you Councillor Badruddin. Thank you, Chairperson. I just want to make sure that my camera is working. Yes, there we go. Chairperson, I want to start with a question relating to um, the high numbers that are seen uh, in the Western Cape and specifically uh, the city of Cape Town. But I first need to make the point that the public health um, interventions in the city and in the province are led by the provincial um, Department of Health as the lead department and through our departments within the city, uh, the environmental health team as well as our contact and tracing team, um, we, we support the efforts to be able to identify um, individuals who are one, positive, but also two, uh, whose contacts may be positive as well, at least in the initial stage of uh, the, the approach that the Western Cape government had adopted in addressing uh, our COVID pandemic here in the province. Subsequent to that, uh, the approach has since changed to focus on the high-risk groups within the province, and so too it's the same principle is applied uh, in the city of Cape Town. And so the question in terms of why the numbers are so high, I think, can be made by the fact that Unlike other provinces, the cities and the, the, the Western Cape provinces approach has been very strategic uh, in the sense that when there is a positively identified uh, COVID-19 patient, 
what happens is that a number of role players in a team contact that individual to identify whether or not they have access to quarantine isolation facilities so that the virus uh, in terms of sp uh, further spread is mit mitigated but also to identify uh, the contacts and so that strategic approach is very important uh, to keep in mind because unlike other provinces the city and this province uh, the Western Cape province has, has led uh, the approach in terms of the bushfire model uh, that our prim that our um, Minister of Health in the province uh, has has um, taken forward on this side. Also, I think it's a very important point to make um, that at one point the NICD statistics uh, show that the Western Cape specimens made up at least one quarter of all lab tests uh, that were conducted nationally, and that's a very, um, a very important statistic to make. Um, and it supports my, my information that I shared previously to say that we as a city and as a province have been very proactive to identify potential um, positive cases. And so, too, uh, at the same time, in about mid-April, the very same statistics uh, showed that uh, if I make a comparison now, that 1% um, of Gauteng's tests came back as positive, whereas the Western Cape had about 12.1% of its tests um, coming back uh, as positive. And that's, that's very important to make because it suggests very clearly uh, why our, our numbers are so high in the province, because we've been strategic uh, in our approach to identify and manage very early on uh, in the stage of, of contracting the virus. And so it's not about um, the number of tests that are being done alone. Um, it's also important to keep in mind the quality of the tests uh, that are being done, which speaks to that um, high percentage that I've shared with you uh, now as well. And so this proactive approach was very important, especially very early on, because if I use the public health um, terminology, uh, there may have been seeding in this province long before any other province uh, received any number of asymptomatic uh, COVID cases uh, on their side. And so with that being said, and it goes actually goes without saying that because this province welcomes a number of uh, international visitors um, uh, to our, into our tourism, uh, tourist industry, and because we welcome a number of other citizens in our country uh, into our city specifically to access education and uh, other opportunities such as employment, and, and whatever else the case may be, that yes, it is likely that we uh, have been more at risk because of the seeding concept that I've now uh, shared with you. And so that's very important uh, to keep in mind when it comes to why our numbers are so high. And again, it's because we've adopted a very strategic approach uh, very, very early on. In terms of the, the clinics that were closed, uh, that Honorable Hadebe uh, asked, I think it goes without saying again here, yeah, Chairperson, that especially in the city where the rate of transmission, especially local transmission, uh, is so high means that any number of residents, any number of frontline staff uh, face the risk of exposure to COVID-19. And so when residents access um, our services at a clinic, it means that uh, patients are at risk and that uh, staff are at risk as well. But here again, the city has been very proactive uh, in our approach to make sure that the number of clinics uh, that close as a result of uh, exposure and that close as a result of the risk assessment that is conducted um, by the city to make the decision to close is being minimized. Um, the city has launched uh, what we're calling our a decanting project where a number of facilities um, closely linked to a clinic are being erected at the moment. Up to 80 uh, clinics, and the deputy mayor mentioned that we manage about 100 
up to 80 clinics in the city of Cape Town are being kitted out with additional decanting uh, facilities where those who need to access either chronic, uh, chronic medication or those who are coming for their appointments uh, to the clinic um, or those who are requiring, required to be removed from the general patient population into an area where they can be screened and tested uh, and managed accordingly should they have respiratory symptoms that may suggest COVID-19 can then be managed accordingly in spaces outside of an environment that puts not only the clinic at risk, but the staff and other residents as well. And so we are very proactive uh, in, that, in that regard with phase one uh, being concluded next week, Tuesday, um, and then phase two uh, starting, uh, not, uh, starting at the same time as the contractors are able uh, to, to move their services so that there's not a lag period uh, between phase phase one and, and phase two. I must also mention the fact that uh, some members here may uh, be aware that there is a lot of uh, apprehension with regard to the uh, cleaning of our facilities, the deep cleaning of our facilities. And I put it to the members here that unlike other cities, this very city, the city of Cape Town, is very serious about making sure that all of our facilities uh, remain open when and where possible so that the residents' uh, access to services aren't compromised, which may have uh, later on consequences when it comes to accessing uh, the, the treatment. Um, in terms of the other questions that have been asked, uh, spe specifically around the matter of um, uh, homelessness in the city of Cape Town, I want to use this opportunity to say that the matter of homelessness, according to the Constitution, does not fall into the ambit of local government. To this regard, Salga has already written to um, the National Department of Social Development on the 16th of April, uh, Mr. Uh, Tony, the acting DG, to advise that according to the Constitution, there is a concurrent mandate between provincial governments as well as national governments to ensure that the vulnerable group, which is homeless people, are looked after adequately. Very importantly, uh, the, the, the COCTA, Department also instituted regulations under Regulation 5 and in Regulation 4 that clearly stated that it's state's responsibility to identify a shelter space for homeless to be evacuated into. With that being said, the city had to once again act proactively to ensure that our homeless community can be sheltered in a safe space away from the virus because simply the assistance from uh, the appropriate department on a national level was not forthcoming and we were well aware that if we allowed our homeless people to remain on the street, the risk of exposure to themselves but also to other community members is great. And so the city then moved to identify what we called a macro site, uh, a macro site where we offered a number of services to our homeless people, from daily clinic services where up to 15 doctors, nurses, volunteers, pharmacists uh, manned our clinic facility where the homeless people at Strandfontein were able to access these services. And with that being said, the phenomenal successes that have come out of that. Over 1,500 individuals uh, access some form of care, uh, either identifying new uh, medical conditions that they may not have known, such as cholesterol, diabetes, hypertension, any number of other conditions, but also to help uh, the individuals who, whose conditions were uncontrolled from controlling them. Very importantly, the facility also had quarantine uh, and isolation spaces because it goes without saying that every single homeless person who accessed Strandfontein was screened at least three times uh, by the time the facility had closed and those who required access to quarantine and isolation were helped into those facilities. And another success that came out, out of Strandfontein was the fact that not a single homeless person at Strandfontein tested positive uh, through the test 
that uh, we conducted. On top of that is the fact that over 120 uh, individuals were reunited with their families where they chose this as an option, but also the fact that we offered psychosocial rehabilitative services through our partners who helped us. And there are a lot of anecdotal stories where homeless people will uh, note that they've never been able to smell the sea the way that they are now able to smell the sea because they've uh, been helped off drugs and because we've been able to uh, um, help them to four meals a day, hot showers, mattresses, beds, and a number of other services that have made this site very unique. Again, unlike other cities where tents, small tents have simply been put up on fields uh, without the necessary services being uh, connected to them and allowing our very, very vulnerable homeless people to, to fend for themselves, uh, except for where charitable organizations are able to assist. I apologize. Is it low setting? I What's going on? What's going on? I apologize, Chair. For the lights. Sure. And I apologize, Chair. The, the Civic Center has uh, smart lights, so they go off when there's not movement to save uh, electricity. Oh, I'm back. But I'm back. Um, so that may happen if I continue to talk again. So it's important to give that then context. Then you must to move towards concluding. I'm moving, Chair. So it's very important to give that context about uh, Strandfontein because before Strandfontein was closed, Strandfontein closed as a result of lockdown level four. Lockdown level four says that the state must provide shelter for our homeless people, but it removed the responsibility to evacuate homeless people into these spaces, which then saw homeless people moving back into the communities that they've come from. But before that happened, Chairperson, our social development department, as well as our street people unit, were very proactive to engage with every single homeless person to offer them either reintegration, reunification if they choose, or help into a shelter uh, that we were assisting and about 300 or so had accepted um, assistance into a shelter. The suggestion by one of the honorable members that the city had dumped people under a bridge is incorrect for the reason that those people who had found themselves under the bridge had opted to go uh, to that facility where we are preparing our third sp safe space uh, in the city of Cape Town. And that's an important fact, Chairperson, because the media had incorrectly reported that we had dumped them against their will uh, in that facility and that, we've not opt and that we've not provided the necessary support. And I want to emphasize here that every single individual who chose to go uh, to our Coulombberg space where we're currently busy with the expansion, chose to do so under their own uh, volition, not accepting our assistance into uh, a shelter which we, uh, which we offered to them, but also a shelter where they'd still be able to uh, access um, uh, sh uh, food and showers and, and a bed. But with that being said, the other question comes to what happened what is the city doing uh, to, to, to address those who are still on the street? And it's so easy for people who are sitting, and, and, I, don't, and I don't refer now specifically to the honorable members, but those who are commenting in the space. It's so easy for those who are commenting to suggest that all homeless people want access uh, to shelter, and that's wrong, Chairperson. Because what we don't take into consideration is the fact that our homeless group is a non-homogenous group of people, people who are exposed to traumatic circumstances, people who are on substances, people who have... Uh, um, psychiatric conditions, people who are frail and require therefore access to other services like re rehabilitation, frail care services um, and, and other services that, that need to be provided. And our street people unit, which is, uh, um, which is active across our city, engages daily with all homeless people to offer them access to shelter. And so it's incorrect to suggest that there are no spaces in our shelters today because the numbers that have been shared with me prior to this um, prior to this portfolio committee says that about a hundred shelter spaces exist in the city but when our street people unit offer these homeless people have a preference to remain in the communities where they've come from. 
And the city's approach to help homeless people is a holistic one, not simply to provide shelter, but to provide shelter with upskilling opportunities, with uh, access to employment, with access to rehabilitation that we are doing quite actively with our partners. And we, I put it to the committee, we are the only city in the country that in our adjustment budget that we've just passed approved 20 million rand towards shelter organizations as well as service providers. Something went wrong. It's his network. It's his network. Maybe also to say... Are you okay? Uh, we seem to have lost uh, Councillor Badruddin, Madam Chair. Um, who work directly with okay. okay. people, and so too in our. Oh. Hey, Chair. Chairperson. Are you okay? Chairperson. Yes. You, you know how the, the internet kicks me off when we are together. Um, but let me quickly tie that one up. Um, let me quickly, I want to quickly try that one up there. Um, where there exist shelters, the city is erecting prefabs to, to inject additional beds up to the number of 300. We are also uh, implementing more safe spaces across the city that can deal with our homeless people very holistically. And so that's a project that is currently underway that we are driving. Um, the, the Honorable Member Hadebe also mentioned that MPs were prohibited from entering shelters, and I want to respectfully put it to the uh, Honourable Member that the biggest risk to our homeless people at Strandfontein are those individuals who come from the outside to try and introduce a virus into the community because we as outside individuals are exposed to the virus because of the work that we are doing. But I also want to remind the committee that the regulations are very clear that these spaces need to be considered quarantine facilities and for that reason access must be strictly regulated to protect the individuals uh, who, are, who are in these spaces. Chairperson, I want to quickly touch on the issue of quarantine and isolation. Um, the question that was asked by the Honorable Makalipi, uh, as I mentioned earlier and as the Deputy mentioned earlier, province is leading um, the 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 um, project of of quarantine and isolation facilities in terms of the management and the implementation thereof, but the city has made available all of its facilities that province has identified uh, as quarantine and isolation facilities, especially uh, in our vulnerable communities where access to these quarantine and isolation facilities are much needed. And so our resorts, all the way from Numzamo, all the way to Kailicha, all the way to the False Bay coastline, have been identified for this purpose because we were well aware of the challenges that our highly vulnerable communities face. And so we're so very sensitive uh, to make sure that as a caring government, we, we make these facilities uh, available. Um, in terms of the other question that Councillor Makalipi asked, what I took away from this committee when we uh, had lost it together was the fact that notwithstanding the matter that council was on the recess, um, the city now every Friday, every week, presents a weekly briefing to all councillors. Uh, and I lead this um, on behalf of the mayor, where I share with councillors not only the updates uh, that the city has undertaken that week across all of our hotspots when it comes to public transport interchanges, solid waste, public health, etc., etc., so that they are equipped with the information to educate their communities as well, because we as the city don't want a circumstance, circumstances where our councillors are ill-informed. So we will continue uh, our briefings uh, with all of our councillors every week and um, up, up for the past three or four briefings that uh, I've hosted, uh, about 100 councillors uh, have attended these briefings and the number of questions are asked that we then, um, that we then uh, present answers to uh, at follow-up meetings. In terms of the, the litigation, again, that the city has undertaken when it comes to the Human Rights Commission, and I've said this over and over, Chairperson, and I, I must use this opportunity to repeat myself, that the city in no way 
questions the responsibilities of the Human Rights Commission. We respect the role of the Human Rights Commission. But what we cannot allow are monitors who have bullied our nurses at Strandfontein to the point of tears because of the way that they've engaged with our nurses and our other uh, staff uh, at that particular facility. And we've been very clear that according to the Act, in our interpretation, that there is not an automatic transfer of powers that are given to a commissioner uh, that are then moved over to a monitor. We've been very clear in that regard. And initially, uh, when the matter was before the court, the court had also supported this and had actually noted that the individuals who were stated in the court um, action initially uh, were not allowed onto the facility and that staff members of the Human Rights Commission should act as home as um, monitors uh, at the facility. And so it's very important to know that what we've, the action that we've undertaken is not because we're trying to inhibit the responsibilities of this institution, but rather that we believe that the responsibilities are so great that any monitor connected to this institution must conduct themselves responsibly and respectfully when it comes to the staff members that they engage with, but also our vulnerable uh, homeless people, uh, in this case, at, at Strandfontein. Chairperson, I think that I've answered um, the, the questions that have been posed to me, and if there are any that I've missed, I'm happy to uh, provide further clarity. Thank you very much. Thank you. Madam Chair, could I request uh, the, uh, the CFO to, to respond to the question around the contract and yes. other points, yes. financial points? Yes. Mr. Jacoby. Kevin Jacoby, can you respond to the issues? Hello, Chair. I trust that you can see me. Can you see me? No, no, no. no. I still <laughs> want to see you. <laughs> I'll put my video on. Maybe it's just the data line. I'll yeah, wait until my picture go. goes there through this tube. <laughs> okay. Welcome to my home, uh, Chairperson. Oh, thank you so much, Kevin. <laughs> um, Chairperson, um, I wanted to start. <laughs> thank you. We are there. Ngozi cool. I just wanted to start with the conditional grants first. Um, yes. There was a question around the conditional grants, and I didn't have the numbers earlier on, but seeing that the response have been so long, I've been able to solicit the most up-to-date uh, um, spending. Um, Chairperson, on the energy efficiency and demand side grant that we received from national government, we've spent 97% as at the end of, I'm sorry, as at the first week of June. On the expanded public works program, which is a labor intensive program, we've spent 60%. On the finance management grant, 100%. On the informal settlements upgrade partnership grant that we had, what, that we received, we've spent 50%. On the infrastructure skills development grant, we've spent 97%. On the Integrated City Development Grant, which is a bigger grant, we've spent 67%. On the Municipal Disaster Recovery Grant, we've spent 99%. Um, on the Neighbourhood Development Grant, and this is one where we've seriously underperformed and the members were quite right to mention it, is the Neighbourhood, as I said, the Neighbourhood Development Grant. It's 40 million strong, but I can reassure you that I was um, given information this evening after the question was asked is that each one of the, or the full 42 million has been now contractually committed um, through the bid adjudication committee and through our tender processes. On the public transport network grant, we've spent 78%. And then on our urban settlements development grant, we've spent 64%. But then, Chairperson, I just wanted to record, obviously, my gratitude to national government is that when we started dealing with this COVID pandemic response, one of the things that we needed to really undertake is, a, is, is to put resources aside and what National Treasury did together with the land departments national that are responsible for the PTNG, which is typically transport orientated, and the USDG, which is across all services, is they allowed us to convert what is, which, is, which is typically capital grants as well to extract certain components of it and make it operational to help us respond. So a lot of what you heard about from water services, etc., are funded from the USDG and a lot of our cleansing that takes place at our taxi ranks and our public transport interchanges is coming out of that PTNG, and we're extremely grateful uh, for that level of, of, of assistance. And then uh, before I get on to the mask issue, um, the Deputy Mayor, when he was talking, he gave a reflection on local content. It's a frustration, and, and the example he used was a general one, uh, and, which is absolutely factual. I wanted to highlight 
uh, one for you that already come closer to home. And that is you would realize that um, organizations under lockdown level four and three in particular allowed the bringing back of staff. So come back to work plans in particular areas. And as a government service, obviously, we need to provide services. But what we were required to do is provide our staff with cloth masks. And for the city of Cape Town, we require 40,000 um, of these masks because every staff member has to receive two. The service providers that we engaged with could not source the material that was required for these face masks that measures up to the OHS, which is Occupational Health and Safety Standard, from a service provider that had the material locally manufactured or put together. The only way they could access that material is to import it. But because of local content, we could not go ahead with that acquisition. So under the emergency procurement allowances that we have, even under the COVID pandemic space, is the local content issues are still used in a very inflexible way. Uh, we fully appreciate the fact that we need to add to the benefit of our own economy, uh, but there are certain times when we need to bring staff back for services where we need a relaxation on what might be within a regulation. So we don't dispute the entire um, clauses within it, but sometimes it can be really painful when, when an organization is, is rendering services. There's only one of them, and we can discuss the rest at the later stage. For Councillor Hadeb, it was nice seeing his face. He was one of my councillors on the finance PC, so you, you would be familiar to see me. It was good to see him sporting his normal personality, which is always lovely. Um, he's always been a nice uh, gentleman to deal with. Um, Councillor Hadeb, uh, um, I would also not, to, uh, not like to pay 50 rand for a mask, but factually we are paying 50 rand uh, uh, for the masks. Um, National Treasury sent out a price list um, for these masks, which are typically, N, uh, they're called N95 masks, and the Deputy Mayor already indicated that these are masks that are typically used by doctors and nurses and frontline staff and, uh, and so forth. Clearly, there's a, a market shortage as far as these masks are concerned, together with the FFP2 uh, masks. In fact, I must say to you that across the entire PPE need that we have as an organization, there are shortages in the country, and I don't think that's new to anyone that's within this committee. Um, we sent out an RFQ, which is a request um, for, for quotations. Um, we had over 40 responses, so we're quite um, satisfied that the response that we got from the market and the price that we eventually settled on was market-related um, in, in its fullest ten sense. Um, as I said to you, the National Treasury list says that a benchmark, and remember, time goes by, demand and supply shifts as well, is National Treasury was indicating that we should pay around about 37 Rand for a mask of this nature. What we found is that the masks that were coming forward and being promoted to the city that met that price range didn't meet the OHS standard, the Occupational Health and Safety Standards. So we could not allocate these to our staff. You asked the question, what value is there in a mask of this level to a city and to the ratepayer? How could it be that we have to pay this amount of money for a mask? The value add is never in the material that is used to put that mask together. But we settled with a, between a rock and a hard place. If it is that we require our nurses and our doctors and that to perform their duties, it is our regulatory mandate to provide them, besides our moral mandate, with the PPE that is prescribed to protect them to undertake those services. And that is what the market offered to us. We're quite happy in our supply chain management practices through the whole PPE acquisition within the city that we've got it watertight. We allow for a competitive space. And when we deviate from the National Treasury pricing, um, when the market can't um, perform within that threshold that's been created, we report every one of those eventualities to the city manager in terms of true governance. And what will happen is that as soon as um, the, the disaster period is over, we're mandated to report all of these deviations. And they're not supply chain management deviations, we're talking about deviations from the circular um, up to council. So we'll do it in a full, transparent manner. Uh, but that is what the market has and the choice that the city has then do we then provide nurses and doctors at this time, which is our major pandemic response, or not? And the answer is we have to, and so we have to match then what the market requires. And then, Chair, I just wanted to say to you that the market has been very disturbing, and I've noticed that how we engage with the market is in a very honest way, but sometimes the market can be dishonest as well, where they accept orders from the city after an, a, a full process, supply process has been undertaken, and uh, once they've received the order, obviously other organizations buy out that stock and we get informed, um, sorry, the order won't be arriving. And that is very disruptive to our organization. We've kept track of every behavioral pattern of every service provider that we've tried to engage with across all the PPE spectrum. And we'll be reporting them all to National Treasury, especially those that have been exploitive as far as pricing is concerned. Thanks for the opportunity to talk to you, Chair, and your committee. 
Thank you so much, Mr. Jacobi. The city mayor did everybody was supposed to respond. Yes, Madam Chair, that's that's uh, all that we had. I hope we have uh, adequately covered the questions. Okay, colleagues, Honourable, follow up questions. Yes, uh, yes Honourable Hadebe uh, slash Councillor Hadebe. Can you allow each other to breathe so that I know you properly? It's Hadebe. Yes, Mukalipi. Kalipi. Who else? The two of you. Okay. Oh, okay. Yes. Uh, so uh, uh, the is saying I must start. Uh -uh. Oh, the next right. Yes, Mukadere, you'll come at them, Kalipi. Let's let this first. Oh, okay. yes. And as for you, you got a a a a, a compliment uh, from Mr. Kevin Jacobi. So, yes, yeah, yeah. Yeah. while you celebrate, yeah, let me behave as such. Yes. No, proceed, Mkalip. Proceed, Mkalip. Who, Mr. Who Mr. Jacobin was saying that Hadebe is his product, Chairperson. We note that. As this yes, committee. we noted that. We noted that. Okay, thank you very much, Chair. First of all, um, I will say that I don't know why all of those delegations from the city of the Cape Town city, they chose to answer me when I was engaging them in terms of their presentation. I asked some specific question in terms of uh, the current collection. Uh, I asked them, can they just give us a clarity? What is the secret of collecting more? in May while they were struggling to collect more in April. So we wanted to share that secret with other municipalities because it's a cause for concern for most of the municipalities. And if the city of Cape Town managed to collect more revenue during COVID-19, they must tell us how do they manage that. Is the slides, is, that one is on slide number three of the presentation. Uh, number two, I asked them about this uh, on slide 12, Chairperson assisting the consumers and customers. I said to them they must share with us in details what do they mean if they say they are going to provide loans for their qualify for those loans, etc., etc. So they never bothered to answer me. Nevertheless, Chairperson, uh, I wanted to say that when the Deputy Mayor was trying to also give explanation in terms of what we have raised here uh, as colleagues, we raised sharply uh, in terms of the evictions that is taking place, especially during this COVID. And that's why two of my colleagues here uh, were up in arms because the mayor was displaying an arrogance attitude. And thanks to you, Chairperson, because we have managed to reprimand him and to say that they, he must understand that this committee is doing their work. So he must not behave as if we are here as political parties. He must all the time bear in mind if the portfolio committee is asking him in his capacity as the mayor, as a deputy mayor, as an official of the city of Cape Town to come and share with us what they are doing. Not in a political debate, you are not heading for any elections here, but you are doing our jobs, he must be accountable. So that arrogance that he displayed here, as a result, you chairperson will come down the situation, it must be condemned in no certain terms. Without having saying that, Chairperson, I just want to repeat to say that it's not true of what he's saying uh, regarding the evictions that is taking place today in Hot Bay. I'm glad that Honorable Hadebe also uh, mentioned very clearly that those people were the residents of Hot Bay 11 years ago. And I was waiting for that response because they are very quick to say that even the Johannesburg municipality just to display to him that we are not doing that because he's a DA. Although we know that uh, there are some agendas that is being persuaded in, in Cape Town. But we're also confronting the mayor of Johannesburg, which is the AIN, because they have also the similar situation. All of us with ANC members here, we came very clean to say that during COVID-19, you can't be heartless. And I know that they were going to be their defense to say that, no, people were doing that 
uh, with opportunistic reasons, which is not true. In what 95, when they came here for the first time, what 95, they tried to say exactly that until the Minister of Housing, Lindy Westisulu, and you mentioned also, Chair, that there was there is a court case of which the city of Cape Town lost it, and their MMC uh, went there, and he was also doing interviews on cameras until the people of 195 chased him away because he was pulling exactly the same stance uh, uh, trying to, 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 to mislead the nation saying that people have erected new uh, 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 houses which was not true. So as a result those people of 195 have able to go back and, uh, 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 and, uh, uh, and erect those houses where the city of Cape Town was chasing them away. It's the same situation that you are questioning here. Okay, nevertheless, let's say again what the deputy mayor is saying is true. But how come, as a, a leadership of the city, during this uh, weather, I mean, where is human being, the element of being a human being? Where, where, where is it? How can you, I mean, you manage to evict people during this cold that is unacceptable. And we know the history of Cape Town with evicting people. They even also uh, disrespect the court orders. You remember the issue of those foreign brothers and sisters as well. Even the court order saying that, no, find the alternative venue. And they didn't. So we are raising these issues because we know the history of Cape Town vis-a-vis -vis black people. So that's why I was asking specifically the mayor, that they are doing this thing because they know Uguti, those are the poor people who does not have any alternative because they are poor. They must show, they must provide leadership when it comes to these things because it's very difficult. So therefore, we need to get clear answers. Secondly, the councillor here, I, I can't remember his name, is councillor Aziz or is councillor the one that he spoke for a, a long time trying to defend something that we need also to come very clear. Honorable members of parliament, including Honorable Peggy and Honorable Teza, were prevented to do their work as members of parliament. And it's coming to justify, to say that those quarantine sites is because of COVID-19. Those are the members of parliament who are expected to do their oversight. He must know better as a councillor as well. I can't, we can't even manage to say that we are going to assume what he's saying is true because we know what is not true. They are playing politics which is not going to assist anyone. We are doing our oversight as members of parliament, as public uh, representatives. No one must stop us because we are also helping them in a process to identify some of the things that need to be addressed by the city of Cape Town. So he must not come and think that he's dealing with children here. We are not kids here. We know what we're supposed to do as members of parliament. You can't be telling me as a member of parliament that I'm prevented to come and do the oversight here because of COVID-19. I know very well that I must put my mask. I must make sure that everyone near me is also putting her or his mask. And, uh, and that one can't be also be a, a chairperson. We can't, we can't accept that. So I'm advising them as the, the city of Cape Town, if they come to the portfolio committee, they must not come with a politics in their head. They must come with factors, they must come with issues in order to address those issues. So I raised the issue of other councillors from other political parties. And he is saying that every Friday he's having a meeting to brief other councillors. I will take that one and then I will make sure if I will with those councillors who are telling us that they don't know anything the city of Cape Town is doing. I'll make sure that I'll get his number. I'll call him when I get the similar problems or the similar complaint of councillors of being excluded during COVID-19. Coming back to the issue of water chairperson, I think one of my colleagues also have also mentioned what I'm going to mention to that, to, to say that what they are presenting to us chairperson is just a lip service. They do don't care about informal settlement. If you look at the of the presentation, the one that was presenting before, I didn't hear him talking now. He was telling us that initially uh, they plan to have 250 water tanks, and then they are hiding behind the resources. They are saying because they didn't have enough money 
they reduced 250 tanks for their phase one to 93 water tanks. So they are telling us that they are having a 1,000 something as informal settlement. But when you look at, uh, at their presentation, when they mention per, per area, for instance, in Monoabisi, the structure there, it means the houses under the Kailisha Monoabisi Park is 7,573. So we must also take into consideration that those structures, people who are also inside the structure, it does not mean it reflects the number that is reported here. You know our black people, they can be 10, they can be 15 within one structure. If you are going to provide 219 water tanks to 7,573 structures, what does that mean? Just tell us how many water tanks, for how, what is the because we are provid, providing here. It's just, just to put on paper, and you want us to accept that you are doing something while you are not doing anything. Because we are even proudly putting on the paper that your phase one, you reduce water tanks from 250 to 93, that is your phase one, and you are done. This is ridiculous. We can't accept that. We can't accept that. So we must raise these issues to say that city of Cape Town, they don't care about the poorest of the poor. That's why they don't have a clear plan. They don't have a clear plan and it's even bad because it's COVID-19. And COVID-19 is exposing them with how they are neglecting the poor people on the informal settlement. So I'm recommending chairs they must go back and redo it, the plan to come back to the committee to satisfy us that our people are safe in the epicenter of Cape Town. Lastly, Chairperson, lastly, I want to concur with Honorable Peggy to say that it's not acceptable. This is the second time we said Mayor of Cape Town must come and account to the committee. We must not accept that. It's just because we wanted to engage with them. Otherwise, we should have said they must go back and fetch their mayor. The mayor is supposed to know when the committee said, come, he must come. And secondly, they must never send a deputy mayor if he's going to display arrogance <coughs> in this committee. Thank you very much. Honorable Hadewe. No, thank you, Honorable Chair. Let me state it up front that um, all these questions that we ask, it's question that we asked previously, except the issue of the mask and uh, uh, for, uh, 8.4 million for food parcel. We even said in that meeting, and I, I repeat, we st uh, uh, some of the answers are not clear and precise. We requested a detailed plan with cost allocation for each program. That was the question if uh, Alderman Ian Nelson uh, was here previously or he got a proper briefing, he would have known what was raised uh, in our meeting. Chair, what we are asking is because it's affecting millions of people, Western Cape and Cape Town in particular is the epicenter of COVID-19 in the country. In some quarters, there are even talks that parliament must be taken to Pretoria because people are afraid to come to Cape Town. Now, when we ask this question, it is in the interest of the public, it is interest in the interest of the poorest of the poor. We are not politicking. So the question that was asked and was not clarified, Alderman L. Nelson is making an, an, an impression that there are certain regulations passed by national government that are impeding city of Cape Town from uh, executing its mandate powers. And when he's asked to respond, he's generalizing that, no, I was not only referring to, to the regulation, but he, he even went further to say, next time when national government made these regulations, must not give us 48 hours to respond because some of these regulations are impeding us. Now, that seeks to suggest that these regulations are in contrary to section 151, subsection 4 of the Constitution that compelled national government not to impede or uh, 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 prohibit municipalities from exercising their function. So the question is, can you specifically direct us to these regulations 
that are impeding you from exercising your function. As this committee, we want to take that up with the executive to look into those, but we cannot generalize and create an impression that there are certain uh, regulations. So I'm requesting a, a, a clear response and an accurate response into specific regulation. The second issue, Chair, uh, when councillors are being briefed and participating in municipal command council, it's something else. In the city of Cape Town, all councillors from other political parties do not participate in what other uh, municipalities are doing across the country of having a joint command centre which is constituted by all political parties that are represented in that council. I want to ask the city, why are they only resorting in informing councillors, not making them to be part of the command centre? You would recall, Chair, you have written a letter to this effect to the uh, municipal manager and the premier requesting that members of this portfolio committee who are residing within the Western Cape must be invited in this command. To date, we have not been uh, invited. So we'd like to get an understanding. And Chair, this issue of Strandfontein, uh, honorable members, we are all entitled to our opinion, but we are not entitled to the facts. If you prohibit MPs from entering there, but you have an audacity to organize a gospel festival of more than uh, 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 20 people to come and sing and pray for those people, but two MPs are not uh, allowed to enter. Uh, that one you can't accept. It's okay for people to come there and sing a gospel festival. Even the leader of the official opposition, who is a councillor of the city of Cape Town, was prohibited from accessing that site. So I do not want when uh, members come here and distort the facts. You are entitled to your opinion, but are not entitled to the fact. Chair, the priority number three that uh, Alderman uh, 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 Limbeck spoke about, that of health and hygiene. I've raised specific questions because previously we were told about the number of uh, uh, taxi rank uh, in the city. They call it public uh, transport interchange. Uh, the, uh, they have used paint to mark the lanes for social distancing. I then ask what measures are in place to make sure that these measures at this painting, you enforce that regulation. I did not get an answer. I then requested to be given a detailed response. I even went as far as saying you have law enforcement agencies in the city of Cape Town. You have metro police. You also have transport law enforcement. The regulation compels you to put measures in place to reduce the spread on in, of, of infection by making sure that you are enforcing regulations. Do not shift the responsibility to SEBS and, and national government. If they are failing, we're going to also invite them to come and account. City of Cape Town still has a responsibility as the local sphere of government to also ensure that the spread of infection is reduced. You have those three agencies. How many law enforcement agencies are deployed uh, in Mitchell's Plain? How many are deployed in Manenberg? How many are deployed in Delft? How many are deployed in Kailicha? We need numbers so that we can be convinced that indeed you are doing something in limiting the spread. Shopping complexes in these townships are full. There is no adherence to social distancing. Hence, we need to know the number of these officers. Where are they deployed? Why are you only prioritizing the affluent areas and not preoccupied with the townships and poor communities? I go there on a daily basis. I don't see a, 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 a slight sight of law enforcement agencies. Where are they? Where are they deployed? That's the answer that we were expecting to get from uh, 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 this meeting. Taxi ranks, we, we need a clear understanding here. The last question that I asked, and I did not get a response, it's in relation to the clinics that were closed. I asked, have they been opened? Uh, I did not get a response. Chair, you had a case 
of Nolungile, a clinic where uh, uh, staff members had to protest and the clinic was closed down. 15 staff members tested positive to the uh, uh, COVID-19. Seven of those were nurses. They were protesting in relation of not having PPE. Now, the question that I'm asking, have you addressed those matters? But the answer we are getting, they are generalizing. They are not specific. Say, out of these that we closed, this one has opened. We still have challenge with this one. And the, the, the status quo in relation to those uh, clinics is that maybe four out of five uh, or out of six are operational. Need details. And this is not the information that we're asking for the first time. I repeat, the information was requested previously. And it's not forthcoming even now. Those were my last and two cents contribution here. And indeed, uh, it was nice to, to, to see the CFO, uh, uh, Mr. Jacob. Yes, yeah. I've learned a lot from that man. And I was expecting he was going to address us in Costa. He knows Costa too. Eh? Uh, I'm, I'm pleased to, to, to see him. Indeed, I've, I, I've learned a lot, yeah. especially when it comes to financial. Indeed, you're, confirming, you're confirming Kalipi's assertion that you are the product. It's okay. Honorable Usain? Honorable Usain? Yeah, uh, Chair, thank you very much. Um, I'm sorry I jumped in at the very last minute, but it reminded me of a point uh, that I wanted to raise when uh, Honorable Adebe had spoken about the, uh, the oversight of MPs to the command councils. You'll recall, Chairperson, I raised this matter previously. Uh, and I think it will be appropriate to raise it again. And on the previous occasion, when uh, when the matter came before the portfolio committee, in the case of a Tigrini and KZN, for example, I made the point at that stage that I think, as a matter of principle, I think that all command councils should in the least allow uh, for some level of oversight. And there's a problem in terms of the existing regulations and the act that it doesn't allow for sub uh, sufficient oversight of the lockdown regulations in general, as well as for the MPs of the Portfolio Committee in their respective provinces. And I mean, I appreciate your efforts, Chairperson, in trying to, to engage with the different provinces. Uh, in KZN, for in particular, for example, I raised the concern, similar to what Hadebe is raising, that uh, neither Honorable Mkalipi or myself to this day have still not been allowed to uh, to attend the, um, the KZN Command Council as well as the Tigrini uh, Command Councils. Notwithstanding all the efforts that you have put in, I've asked that you take the matter up also with the leader of government business. So as a matter of principle, I do believe that um, uh, MPs of Parliament uh, should uh, be allowed to conduct uh, some oversight over uh, the different Command Councils. But of course, there is also you know, some... Um, gray areas in respect of to what extent are they are we allowed to do so. So it's a matter, I think, that, Chairperson, we mustn't leave. We must still take up on it and, as far as possible, encourage uh, the MECs of the different provinces, um, you know, engage them on it. Uh, I think our role is critical in terms of the lockdown regulation. So my appeal also to the, to the city of Cape Town is that uh, wherever it is possible, um, for the sake of transparency, uh, that we allow opposition parties also to co conduct some level of oversight. Uh, I, I don't think that there's anything that we need to hide from what's going on, and perhaps maybe there's an opportunity for us to be able to at least make a positive contribution, provided also that in my case, if I have to attend the, 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 the command councils here, that I will use it as an opportunity to make some uh, positive contribution for the benefit of everybody. So. If there is a possibility for the City of Cape Town to be able to accommodate uh, uh, members of the Portfolio Committee um, uh, to attend some of those uh, command councils, I think it can only serve uh, you know, to, to the betterment of everybody in, in, in that city and uh, in the province in particular as well. Thank you very much. Thank you, Honorable Hussein. Uh, mine is just short, and maybe we'll see as we progress what time. Uh, in terms of the time, how we do. Uh, I think points to note and points to take home for the benefit of everybody who's in this meeting. Uh, the Disaster Management Act regulations under Section 27, 41, and 55 do not require consultation because they are of 
emergency in nature meant to address emergency situations. Only normal regulations under Section 59 requires a consultation. Uh, but for me, I also want to check the following from the city. How is the city applying the district development model approach to dealing with COVID-19 and what partnerships exist? Because as one browses their report, there's nothing that is there or the report is not clear about the partnerships that the city has entered into in terms of the district development model approach. And then the other one is about a the privately owned quarantine facilities. Are there any township people accommodated in those privately owned quarantine facilities? And then uh, has the city also designated COVID-19 hotspot in the city? And what are the local measures in place? Because you know you are expected to designate a hotspot. So maybe you can share with us which ones are the designated hotspots and then what are the local measures that you have put in place. Uh, the other issue, you know now it's winter, it's raining uh, in Cape Town, it's very cold in Cape Town. Can you share with us your contingency plan for this current uh, weather conditions as we speak? And then uh, also there was this issue that it's also linked to this, uh, your progress with regard to your ongoing drought relief intervention. Uh, so those are the issues that one can want to get clarity. But I'm also checking on the time. Uh, let's see if they can cover everything uh, by in the next 10 minutes. Then, yes, so that at least we've already run out of time. Yeah, so that, that we see failing with them, uh, maybe mm. we'll have to ask them to also submit other responses in writing, given the limited short time of, of time. Over to you, Adam and Ian Nelson. <clears throat> Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so I will deal first with the, the questions around uh, why did we collect more in in uh, May than in April? Uh, I thought I had I had responded to that question. I certainly did respond to the question uh, around loans, where I said very clear that that was a misinterpretation. We did not give loans uh, to anyone, but we had to look at very carefully and make sure that we did not fall foul of, of the rules by uh, something that doing something that may turn out to be effectively a loan. So the question around the collecting is, uh, well, first of all, there's, there wasn't uh, that great a difference between uh, April and May's collections. But I think part of, part of the reason uh, is uh, that why we, I think, still have a fairly high level of, uh, of collection in the city, uh, even despite these conditions, is first of all that we have a very good billing system. Uh, we do produce bills, we send bills out. Unfortunately, during this period, because the post office was closed, in fact, they only opened today. Um, so, uh, sorry, Madam Chair, am I still on? Um, uh, Madam Chair, can you still hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, sorry, I, I thought we'd gone off. Um, the okay. uh, uh, it's not it's I say a, a great deal of of, of uh, good billing, uh, but unfortunately the post office was closed. But what uh, did contribute to it is that we have a high level of what we call e-billing. Uh, we have two hundred seventy thousand of our customers. Uh, we have registered their email addresses with us, and we are able then to sell, send our uh, the bills to them by email. Uh, that helped quite significantly during this period, uh, when when the post office was closed. Uh, now that 
you know, one also has to look at the amount of billing between the two months. Uh, and there's a very complex interaction there, but these are all contributing factors. I think many of the questions that were raised around, uh, or the points that were made around evictions and, and uh, so on, well, I, I, Madam Chair, I respectfully, those were debating points rather than questions. Um, uh, and so I'm, I do believe we have already given a fairly comprehensive uh, response on those issues. Um, I will, however, uh, hand over to my colleague, uh, Councillor Badruddin, uh, who will respond uh, to, to many of the other questions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Chair Deputy Mayor. Um, Honourable Makalipi uh, made the point that the Honourable Members were prevented from uh, doing their work at uh, Strandfontein. Uh, I think it's important to note that in no way um, has the City tried actively to prevent Honourable Members or Members of the Opposition uh, from accessing the facility. Very importantly, uh, the City implemented regulations out of this department, uh, COGTA, uh, regarding to the nature of the facility that was very clear that it must be deemed a quarantine uh, facility where individuals who are on their high-risk individuals and should not be exposed to the conditions unnecessarily. And so we implemented that uh, appropriately in terms of the regulations which uh, were promulgated by, by the department. Um, in terms of the, the, my initial answering to the questions, in no way uh, did I try and, and suggest that the honourable members are, are, are to be likened to children. I apologise if that came across uh, in that regard, but I, it's important to know that we only implemented as a city what uh, national government required of us to implement around that uh, particular matter. And it's not so simple, honourable member, to, to suggest that uh, it's a simple donning of of PPE and then it's appropriate to engage with, um, with, with any person because social distancing is, is important and only those who should leave uh, their homes should leave their homes if needs be. And the fact that PPE is not a 100% guarantee of either contracting the virus and or spreading the virus to other vulnerable individuals. And I suggest, uh, and I put it to this committee, that those individuals at Stanfontein are high risk for a number of reasons because of their medical conditions, uh, previous conditions like TB, chronic lung diseases, etc., etc. They may predispose them to contracting the virus from any number of healthy uh, members of parliament who, who may visit that site. In terms of the the um, the uh, the uh, what was referred to as a gospel session, uh, the visit by the uh, religious leaders, um, a request was specifically made to the mayor's office to allow the religious leaders um, on the site so that the spiritual component uh, that a number of homeless people um, uh, who'd, who'd like to have had support in was addressed. Um, importantly, the religious leaders didn't engage with the homeless people um, at the facility, but rather were placed at the site where uh, there was easy view of where this, the um, uh, religious services were, were provided by, by the individuals who adhere to all the necessary requirements and so too as the Deputy Mayor um, noted earlier that any number of individuals could have done the very same thing uh, had the Mayor's uh, uh, office uh, been informed and had the, the um, officials on site made the necessary arrangements and so it's not simply good enough uh, to, to land or to arrive at the front Gate to push in uh, to the facility like a number of um, opposition members in the province and in the city tried, as well as a number of other uh, individuals who are connected to other organizations in the city uh, tried to do, because that's not how uh, the, the matter, um, that's not how we conduct ourselves, at least um, as a city, and in no way uh, did we try to politicize this as a city, and I think it's uh, in actual fact that an absolute, the, the absolute opposite uh, that the organization 
applications. Um, and in this case, I will use the example of the, the monitors um, connected to the Human Rights Commission that leaked uh, their reports to the media without allowing the city uh, to engage on, on the document and to also uh, inform uh, these monitors what efforts were undertaken, significant efforts to address some of these concerns which they didn't take into consideration when making the, the, um, the findings public. And so too, I must use this opportunity to add that the Department of Defense and also representative of, of the uh, Minister of Police's office all visited the facility and were highly impressed with the uh, operation uh, at Strandfontein and commended the, the uh, camp manager and other staff at site for the way in which they worked with the homeless people um, at the facility. Uh, in terms of the weekly briefing, uh, Honorable Makalipi, um, I find it surprising that there are councillors who don't know about this. Um, the invitation is, is a standing invitation in every councillor's diary, uh, and I confirmed that while the Deputy Mayor was speaking. It is, in fact, uh, in my diary for tomorrow uh, where councillors will come, but I also think it's important to note that it's not a compulsory meeting. It's a meeting that we make available so that councillors can engage on the uh, on the information that is being shared, not simply to take the information. And an example I can share with you here is that councillors are very proactive in making recommendations uh, to identify where the reporting done by officials uh, may not be in keeping with their experience in a particular ward. Uh, and so that is then shared in the disaster coordinating team, but also in the joint operations committee through the relevant uh, officials. Um, Councillor Hadebe um, spoke about the city being the epicenter of, um, of, of the COVID pandemic in the country, and I, I had hoped to make it very clear why, in actual fact, our numbers are so high here, for the specific reason uh, of our strategic way in which we test and isolate uh, individuals in keeping with the province's uh, strategy to identify initially uh, any contact, but now to identify high-risk vulnerable groups in hotspots areas. Um, the, the clinics that were closed, Councillor, that's a difficult one to answer because the assumption that is being made is that the doctors, nurses, pharmacists are only exposed to COVID in a clinic and that's incorrect. Any um, any health professional in a facility has access uh, to the PPE and our CFO has made it very clear that health professionals are prioritized when it comes to access uh, to PPE. They are in actual fact the ones who receive these equipment first before any other department. Um, but the assumption that's being made is that COVID-19 is being contracted only in the clinics. But we must keep in mind that in the city and especially in some of our hotspot areas um, the risk of contracting the virus outside, whether at uh, any of the high-risk areas like public transport interchanges, police stations, um, uh, post offices now that they've opened, and a number of other facilities, shopping centers, puts nurses and any individual at the same risk um, that, they, that they may uh, find themselves, whether in and around the clinic. And so we, we mustn't assume that they're only contracting the virus uh, in the clinic. It could come from anywhere, but because of the exposure to other individuals uh, as a result of that. And so with that being said, the clinics that are closed, the list of clinics that are closed are chain, change on a daily basis because of the exposure that is reported uh, by clinics through the officials on the ground, but also because of the risk assessment. So today one clinic may be, may be, um, may be closed, but because it's been deep cleaned and it's been wiped down and the, and the uh, staff members have been assisted, uh, it may open then the following day uh, or, or a few days later depending on the risk assessment. And in the particular case of Nolungkile, you are right that there were a large number of nurses uh, who were exposed uh, to COVID-19, and I can't say whether it's in the clinic or whether it's as a result of exposure uh, to the community. But because of the risk assessment, the following day that these individuals uh, had made known their status, the facility was then closed. Uh, appropriately as it should have done because we've implemented uh, the necessary measures. And so I will follow up the issue of uh, nurses protesting uh, as a result of PPE, but I find it very unlikely because the area manager, professor, uh, the professor that's in charge of uh, that particular area, her and I speak on a daily basis, and this is not a matter uh, in terms of the protest specifically as related to PPE that she's brought to my attention, but if it is a matter, then I'm happy to take that uh, offline and to communicate 
communicate with you directly, um, uh, Honorable Adebe, in terms of how we will ensure uh, this doesn't happen further at uh, any other clinic, but specifically at Nolungville. And also to keep in mind that we are in the process of erecting structures uh, to decant uh, these clinic facilities, so to minimize uh, the risk any further. Um, Chair, you asked the question about the hotspot model. Um, the hotspot model, again, is a proposal that uh, the provincial government had made very, very early on uh, to their counterparts in other spheres of government to address quite strategically where uh, the risk, I apologize. Apologies, Chairperson. Um, I apologize, Chair. I apologize, Chair. Yes, I know that. Um, and so the hotspot model is actually being implemented in a number of areas across the city. Imizamu, Yetu, Hangberg, Klipfontein, Tigerberg regions, where the hotspot model insists that the city works on a transversal nature in terms of the number of departments that have input into our efforts when addressing the mitigating measures that are being implemented, whether it's from the 490 EPWP, uh, EPWP members that will now form part of our education uh, team that goes into communities to inform about quarantine and isolation, how to avoid the virus, etc., etc., uh, whether it's our solid waste department that comes in to clean the public uh, facilities, uh, whether it's our law enforcement officers and the 490-plus uh, volunteers that have assisted that I mentioned previously uh, at this committee as well to, to um, enforce social distancing. We continue to engage with our councillors, especially in the high-risk areas, to let them know uh, what measures are available to them, and particularly it was mentioned in the Kailicha area. And I'm part of the Kailicha um, COVID committee in terms of the, the WhatsApp group, and I've made it very clear uh, to the councillors who are in the Kailicha area uh, through the WhatsApp group that they do have the opportunity, or at that stage had the opportunity, uh, to register volunteers in terms of the disaster um, uh, uh, risk teams that were, are assisting there. But now neighborhood watches are again able to, to, um, to function, and these numbers will uh, increase the number of individuals who um, who are part of our enforcement processes. And so we must work as a collective, which we do across the departments in the city, but also with civic associations, neighborhood watches, to make sure that all gaps are addressed. And this is can only be achieved uh, because we work in partnership and because we work uh, collaboratively, collaboratively uh, to make sure that these gaps are closed uh, as a city. Thank you, Jim. Thank you so much, uh, Councillor Badrodin. Um, Deputy Mayor, is there so, anything uh, that you think? I think, uh, Madam Chair, we've run out of time. Are we, uh, I think we have uh, responded to, to the questions. Um, okay. You have responded to the questions. Like we have said, uh, Cape Town is a safety center hotspot, but the issue of hotspots, the questions that I've raised, none of my questions seem to have been responded to, easier to check. Uh, I've raised several issues in relation to the hotspots, whether we have identified the hotspots areas. Uh, I didn't hear that being responded to. Can I jump in? She, would you mind if I answer? It's Councillor Badruddin again. Yes. Chairperson, so the hotspots have been identified, and this is done uh, in consultation and collaboration with the provincial health department. Uh, the, Cape, the, the city of Cape Town in itself is a district um, of, of the provincial health department, and so within this district, within this city, there are a number of hotspots uh, that have been identified, and I, I mentioned a, a few of them uh, in, in the Klipfontein area, uh, in the in the Hangberg, Houtpei, Imizamu, Yetu area, uh, Kailicha, Gugaletu, um, are but some of the hotspots that have been identified where our efforts in terms of city interventions have been uh, geared, geared to so that uh, where areas require more focused intervention, these particular hotspots, um, through the officials that work in these spaces, 
whether health, whether law enforcement, solid waste, um, whatever the case may be, uh, have input to ensure that there are a number of processes um, that are implemented to make sure that these hotspots, their numbers are contained and that individuals who require testing within the high risk group that the provincial department has identified have quick access to testing and quick access to quarantine and isolation facilities. So the honourable members in this committee mustn't be afraid or, or mustn't be shocked um, when the, the numbers in specific areas increase, but they increase because of the targeted approach that is being adopted uh, by, this, by this province. And so it's not a matter of simply having a test uh, in, let's say, a clinic, but it's a matter of being able to qualify for a test because of the high-risk group, notwithstanding the fact that currently there's a 27,000 um, backlog in number of specimens that are in the national laboratories that are waiting to be tested. That further make difficult our efforts as a city and as a province uh, to ensure that we have a focused approach uh, in the area. But province, through the leadership of uh, MEC Mbombo, are looking at other measures through private uh, facilities and, and purchasing uh, machines to test uh, the specimens as well. Uh, are being investigated and so in this province we're very serious about closing the gap in testing, testing strategically and focusing that uh, through the hotspot approach and the areas that I've now also shared with you. Thank you, Chair. Chairperson, can I ask Councillor Chair, can I ask Councillor Zahidi that when he spoke about all councillors that uh, uh, are not prevented to come and attend the meeting on Friday, does he refer to all councillors as all as 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 well as PR councillors? Uh, thank, thank you, Chair. Um, absolutely, all councillors are invited. Uh, ward councillors, PR councillors, where there does exist an anomaly or where councillors uh, have not received the invite, please, uh, honourable member, if you could ask the councillors who are connected to you uh, to inform me so that. I I can then have the necessary administrative official uh, correct the mailing list that is being uh, that I'm uh, being that I'm using to share the invitation. Uh, but essentially, the invitation goes out to every single councillor. Uh, it's an open invitation uh, that's available to them for this information. Thank you, Chair. Okay, thanks okay. very much, Chair. I'll call you, Sharon. Please get his number. Okay. Uh, can we get uh share with us, maybe you submit in writing uh, uh, your contingency plans for the current uh, weather conditions and in line with this COVID-19 uh, pandemic. Also, the progress with your ongoing uh, drought relief intervention. Can you maybe submit that to us in, in writing, including uh, uh, your you are detailed um, business plan. I think that will assist us a great deal to see how are you then responding in line with your own allocation so that we can also be able to monitor it. And like we said, uh, Cape Town being the epicenter for this disease. So as the committee, I think we've got a keen interest to make sure that we continue to engage with you. There are matters that you said we must refer to the provincial government. Indeed, we are going to, from here, we are going to invite also uh, uh, the, the, the provincial government to come and fill in on what you are saying because uh, the other issue that is of great concern for us, uh, Western Cape uh, screening rate is shockingly low and uh, we are much worried about that as well. And then, uh, so those are the issues that we would love to then uh, check with you, uh, uh, check with the province as well also to say how are they also supporting you because there are certain functions that you have indicated, the issue of schools and all these other related things there, the provincial competence we will be engaging with the province to that effect. Uh, I should think, colleagues, uh, if there's any other issue that you feel they were not adequately responded to. Can you submit the question to Shirin uh, by 10 tomorrow? Shirin will forward the same to the city so that we give them letters by Tuesday to respond to the issues. Because I know 
they might not have exhausted all some of your content. So that's the platform I'm giving you. Then uh, the city will be able to respond. Uh, those of you who wants to call Councilor Zaid Badrodim, he's available definitely. He seems to be the champion of these things. He can. He looks like the lead councillor to that effect. Then he will be of great assistance for follow up. And uh, we've already exceeded Parliament's time by an hour, colleagues. I think we need to come to the end of our meeting, but we also prompted by the deputy mayor as a call to say are free to can stay with us for four hours. I think that in future when we schedule our meetings, we'll do likewise so that we also give them ample time to make a full presentation. Having said that, I just need now to confirm the attendance of uh, members in this meeting. Uh, I'll start with Honorable Kravan uh, Chava and then Honorable Kanya uh, Keza, and then Honorable Gigi Mpumsa, Honorable Beji Hatewe, Honorable Kengi Mkaliki, Honorable Magito, uh, Honorable uh, Hussein Hanif, and uh, Honorable Oberman, that the attendance of this meeting. Our special thanks to both the deputy ministers. They are still with us in our midst, including the senior management team and the colleagues uh, from the department. Uh, Lance, you are here, the CEO of uh, the AG. There is a guest, uh, a Blue ID. I want to thank you and uh, any other, the, the, the parliament a, a committee team, including the Parliament PCS that has been with us. To you, Team K a City of Cape Town, a, it was a, a, a good engagement, at least like you must take it in good spirit, as was said earlier. A, we, as the, we are the lead committee that deals with oversight in relation to the Disaster Management Act and all those regulations. Hence, you find us as your question. The mere fact that you are asking this question, we are also we are checking also whether you are in line, also in compliance with the act, including these regulations that are, are, are always gazetted by the department. So it has been a pleasure to engage with you. But what is concerning, as was indicated, uh, uh, this uh, city being the epicenter, I think we're going to continue to put measures especially when you had me asking the issue of the identifying of the local hotspots and the local measures so that then we reduce the spread of the pandemic. I want to thank you all colleagues. Then the meeting is again. Thank you so much. Thank you, Chairperson. Really, uh, thank you, sir. Can I ask my support staff to remain with me? Just for a few minutes, that's uh, the committee secretary and the content advisor, please. Thank the you. Of you are out. Oh, oh no, not your portfolio committee members, your staff members. Thank you so much, colleagues. So, yeah, bye bye. To enjoy the rest of the evening. We are reconvening tomorrow. What time, Bye-bye. Hey, Papa, I'm reading start at tomorrow. What time? At 5. Okay. Thank you. 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 Thank Yes, leave the meeting so that I can proceed with my support staff and the let's see. Mato leave the meeting. Where is our team at? Kevin, I do leave the meeting. G A G. Oh, you well, now you can remain G G. So person. Mato leave the meeting. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Chair. Good night. Good night, Matlo. Good night. Do I am in chair? Hello, Martins. <laughs> what are the visual guests? Hi, how are you doing?
Kevin, do, Kevin, I do leave my meeting, please. Madam, Madam, Megiko will leave my meeting. Leave. Megiko is a Maya. Who's Madam? Hey, I'm a fool of some my ass, guys. Mado, they're calling from DCS, Chapel. I'm sure she will leave now. Mado, can you excuse us? And then, Rudani, what are you doing here? Rudani. And Rudani as well. Rudani is refusing to leave. I, I can take him out, Chair Person. Remove Rizan. Remove Rizan. Do we need the other visual guest as well? No. Okay, I've removed Rizan. <laughs> no. And, and the other visual guest, do we need oh, the other Andy. visual guest? Um, the other visual guest, I think, uh, is involved is the in the Okay. Maybe, maybe they are involved in televising. And then we have Khalil. Eh? I don't know who Khalil is. I think she's the person we, they are coming to introduce. Okay. Oh, that, that, I can't okay. see uh, oh, Sorry, I'm from Salga. I will leave the meeting now. Okay. Leave. Leave. You must Please also leave. Ask if Leticia is here as well. Leticia, Leticia is the lady that you want to introduce tonight. I don't see Leticia here. Let me just check up. Did she log in or she slept? I don't know. Let me, I'm just checking her check us. <coughs> Hi, Leticia. Hello, Chief. Hello, Martin. <laughs> Martin! Hi, 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 is Martin back? Where have you been? Yes, yes, honorable chair. I'm hiding, chair. What the weather? Yes, yes. Hello, chair. Chairperson. Can you just uh, in to make sure that the link has been sent to Leticia because she's starting to connect? Sorry, no, Andy, like between the two of you, just forward the link to Leticia.